The Elements of Anatomy and Physiology by William Rushenberger. Introduction Natural history, which may be defined the intelligent contemplation of the works of God, is in a manner the most certain and the most noble subject that can occupy the mind of man. In it alone human genius is in full possession of certainty. Philosophy, politics, history, and morality itself are subject to the intellectual revolutions of wavering humanity. But the facts of the creation are as invariable as God, and the analysis obtained from a plant or an insect marks its demonstration with the seal of eternal truth. The double effect of the study of natural history is to impart certainty to the mind and religion to the heart. The creation is as a visible ladder by which man ascends towards the invisible creator. Natural history, the science which is the mother of all sciences, embraces the whole world. Physical knowledge, mathematical knowledge, are all comprehended in its domain. And as we have just said, the teachings of morality here mingle of themselves without any effort with thoughts of religion. It has been said that natural history should be the only reading book of the people. I would add, it should be the first book of childhood. Of all the means which we may successfully employ for awakening the intellect of young people, there is none the results of which are more certain or more durable than curiosity. The desire to know is as natural as reason. It is vivid and active at every period of life, but it is never more so than in youth, when the mind, destitute of knowledge, seizes upon all that presents itself with avidity and willingly gives the attention and study necessary to know, and very naturally contracts the habit of reflection and of being occupied. It is not the labors of the learned that are to be brought to the attention of infancy, but a study of nature, to comprehend which requires scarcely anything but eyes, and which consists in examining carefully the objects of nature, in order to admire their beauties, without diving into their hidden causes. Children are capable of this study, for they have eyes, and they have curiosity. They desire to know, and they are inquiring. A garden, a field, a palace, all is an open book for them, and they should be taught to read in it. It is inconceivable, says Roland, how much children might learn if we could profit by the opportunities which they themselves afford us. To seize upon these opportunities should be a desideratum with instructors and parents. In this, then, behold what nature was without man. But if man appear, if to recur to the brilliant thought of Bacon, man is added to nature, then creation has a voice, a value, a sense. Of the innumerable crowds of animals and of plants that share between them the domain of the earth, and of the marvelous events that renew the face of things, man has become the master and the historian. All have an equal right to his admiration. All are equally subjects of his study. From the almost imperceptible mold to the colossal productions of the vegetable kingdom, from the microscopic animalcule to the elephant and the whale, from the atom of sand to the summit of Atlas he interrogates, he comprehends, he explains them all. Imagination is no longer at the expense of inventing brilliant pictures. Truth alone strikes his mind and elevates his soul, and in place of the confused reveries inspired by chaos appears a science of wisdom, of reason, and of order, which, in a word, is natural history. The individual who enters a field, or strolls upon the bank of a stream, or roams through the forest, if he comprehend the elements of natural history, may read a pleasant story and acquire information at every step, from the great book of nature, which everywhere lies open wide before him. But if ignorant of natural history, this magnificent and varied work is to him no more than is a printed volume to one who never learned a letter. Natural history not only affords us the means of endless amusement, but teaches us to discover the riches of the earth and to gather from them the means of ameliorating and improving the condition of man. End of Introduction Lesson 1 General Notions on Natural History Lesson 1 
the natural sciences and their divisions, definition of zoology, general knowledge necessary to its successful study, the structure of animals and enumeration of their principal organs, classification of the functions of animals. The natural sciences have for their object the study of those beings, the assemblage of which compose the universe. The study is divided into many distinct branches, but these branches are all so linked one to another as to afford a mutual support. The different branches of the natural sciences are physics, chemistry, astronomy, meteorology, and natural history. The name physics is given to that science which embraces the consideration of the general properties of matter, which studies the motions of bodies as well as heat, light, electricity, and attraction, and which applies the knowledge thus acquired to the explanation of the great phenomena of nature. Chemistry has for its object the knowledge of the intimate composition of bodies and the various combinations which may be made from them. It teaches us what are the forming elements of different bodies and how these elements, by combining in various ways, may give rise to other bodies and enables us to understand the properties of all these substances. Natural history, taken in its most general acceptation, should include the study of the form, of the structure, and of the mode of existence of all the bodies of nature, individually considered. But, by common consent, the domain of this science is more limited, and all that has not a direct relation to the physical history of our globe and the beings spread over its surface is excluded. Consequently, it does not embrace the study of the stars, nor the meteors, nor even the air which surrounds our globe, or, in other words, it comprises neither astronomy nor meteorology. Astronomy, if we may so express ourselves, is the natural history of the celestial bodies. By the assistance of observation and calculation, it applies the general laws of physics to the study of the phenomena which the celestial bodies present, and thus determines their form, their volume, the distance which they are separated from our globe as well as from each other, and the movements which they perform in space. Meteorology is in some measure the natural history of the atmosphere. It inquires the origin of thunder, of rain, of hail, of the dew, and falling of meteoric stones, aerolites, and of the various meteors which appear in the heavens. Natural history, properly so called, we repeat, extends its domain over the structure of our globe and over all of the beings found upon its surface. These beings are separated into three groups or kingdoms, the mineral kingdom, the vegetable kingdom, and the animal kingdom. In this way, natural history is divided into three branches. The natural history of minerals and that of the terrestrial globe, which is formed of them, bears the name mineralogy or geology. The natural history of plants is called botany. The natural history of animals is termed zoology. It is the last of these which is to occupy our attention at present. The study of animals as well as the study of plants is subdivided into three principal branches according as they are considered in respect to first, the characteristics which distinguish them from one another, the climate they dwell in, their habits, and second, the internal structures of their bodies. Third, the play of their organs and the manner in which they respectively produce the various phenomena of life. These three branches of natural history of animals and of plants constitute three sciences which are known under names of zoology, or when plants are referred to descriptive botany, anatomy, and physiology. Anatomy treats of the internal conformation of living beings. It studies them by the aid of dissection and acquaints us with the position, the form, and the structure of their organs. 
inasmuch as it embraces the consideration of either animals or plants it constitutes two distinct sciences zoological anatomy and vegetable anatomy physiology is the science of life it teaches the use of different organs and in the manner in which these act to produce the different phenomena that is visible qualities proper to living beings like anatomy it may have for its domain either the animal or vegetable kingdom and it is consequently divided into animal physiology and vegetable physiology it is easy to understand that without the aid of anatomy and physiology the profound study of natural history would be impossible when we wish to obtain an exact idea of a watch we do not limit ourselves to observing its exterior form and to noticing the manner in which the hands turn we open it we examine every wheel every chain every spring we would separate them one by one and study the relations which they have to each other and we would seek to understand their use afterwards we should again put together all the pieces and by re-establishing their mutual relations restore what we had taken from them that is their movements and their play now what the watchmaker does to obtain exact knowledge of a watch the naturalist does as far as he is capable to study an animal or plant by dissection he examines the interior of its body separates the different organs determines their relations and studies their form and nature then he observes their play during life and by making experiments becomes acquainted with their uses unfortunately the naturalist cannot do all the watchmaker does he can destroy but he cannot reconstruct what he has deranged and restore movement to organs which he has separated to study their structure nevertheless by anatomical investigation observation of the vital phenomenon and by physiological experiments he ascertains the mechanism of these complicated machines and succeeds in satisfying ardent curiosity which is one of the characteristic traits of superior intelligence no study can be more grand or more interesting in revealing what is extraordinary in animal organization it leaves us filled with admiration at the sight of this infinite this most astonishing work of the creator considered in their mechanical relation alone the bodies of the animals present us examples of complication and perfection to which our best constructed and most perfect machines do not approach here we find without number models of ingenious contrivances of which the most successful labors of the architect or optician have produced but imperfect copies but these are the least of the wonders which the animal economy offers us the forces which put into action all the material springs of our body are regulated and combined with the wisdom which is far beyond human science and the more we contemplate the play of our organs and the faculties with which they are endowed the more we feel the necessity of recurring to the superior intelligence who has created this admirable production and who has placed in it a principle of existence and of movement to study with profit the particular history of different animals it is necessary as we see to possess some general notions of their anatomy and physiology and it is this preliminary knowledge which is to engage our attention in the first of our course of the general composition of animal bodies and the functions performed by their different organs all living beings are formed of the union of solid and of liquid parts the solid parts are composed of small fibers and little plates so arranged as to contain the liquid parts in spaces left between them they thus form textures or tissues of various kinds and we give the name of organization to the disposition which these tissues assume organized bodies that is bodies having an organization or mode of structure which we have just indicated are the 
only living beings, because their internal conformation is necessary to the maintenance of life. Therefore, non-organized or inorganic bodies, as stones and metals, are incapable of living. The different phenomena by which life manifests itself are always the result of the action of some part of the living body. And these parts, which may be regarded as so many instruments, are called organs. Thus an animal cannot move without the action of certain organs called muscles, or attain a knowledge of that which surrounds him except by the intervention of the organs of sense. When several organs concur to produce the same phenomenon, the assemblage of instruments is termed an apparatus. We say, for example, the apparatus of locomotion to designate the assemblage of organs which serve to transfer an animal from one place to another, and the apparatus of digestion to designate the assemblage of organs by the assistance of which the animals digest its food. The action of one of these organs, or of one of these apparatus, or the use of which they are designed, is called a function. We say, therefore, function of locomotion, to designate the action of all of the parts of the apparatus of locomotion. The function of digestion, to designate the action of the different parts which constitute the digestive apparatus and functions of the stomach, functions of the intestines, functions of the teeth, and etc., to designate the uses of these different organs. With man, as well as with all quadrupeds, birds, and a majority of other animals, the organs and the functions which the latter exercise are very various. Considered individually, the body of the majority of animals is divided into three principal portions, the head, the trunk, and the members, or extremities. The head, which is not found with all animals, oysters for instance, is subdivided into two parts, the cranium, or skull, and the face. The trunk is composed also of two parts, the chest, or thorax, and the belly, or abdomen. In most of the animals at present referred to, the members exist in double pairs and are distinguished as superior or thoracic and posterior or abdominal or inferior members or extremities. Certain animals, such as the whale, have only a single pair. Others, such as serpents, have none at all, and others again have a considerable number. Insects have three pairs of feet. Spiders, four pairs. Crabs and lobsters, five pairs. The wood louse, or palmer, seven pairs. And certain worms have as many as five hundred pairs. In all of these animals, the body is enveloped on all sides in a resisting membrane, endowed with sensibility, which is termed the skin. It is secured from the inside, and its general form is determined by the solid frame, composed of a number of bones called a skeleton, frontispiece. Farther on, we shall enumerate these bones, speak of their names in various forms. The skeleton does not exist with all animals. Oysters and snails, for example, are without it. And with others again, such as lobsters, the skin acquires an extreme hardness and answers in place of the bony frame. But with all mammiferous animals, birds, reptiles, and fishes, there exists a skeleton, arranged in a manner analogous to that of man. Between this internal frame and the skin, or external envelope, are found the muscles which constitute what is commonly called flesh, whose function is to produce by their contractions all the motions which the animal performs. Between these muscles are placed the vessels which carry the blood to different points in the body, and the nerves which give sensibility. Within the head and in the trunk we find also other parts. The face presents several cavities, which serve to lodge 
the organs of sight, of smell, and of taste. The cranium or skull is a sort of bony box, the interior of which is filled by one of the most important organs of the body, the brain, which is continued downward in a thick, whitish cord called the spinal marrow. It descends along the neck and communicates with the principal nerves of the body. On cutting through the ribs and opening the bony cage, which anatomists call the thorax, and which we commonly call the chest or breast, we find the heart and lungs. A fleshy partition, the diaphragm, separates the chest from the belly or abdomen, and in this latter cavity are contained the stomach, the intestines, the liver, the spleen, and many other organs of less importance. These different organs fulfill very various functions, some such as the mouth, the teeth, the stomach, the intestines, and the liver serve digestion. Others, such as the lungs, are designed for respiration. Others, again, the heart, for example, distribute to all the organs matter necessary for their nourishment, and there are others, again, the use of which is to enable us to appreciate tastes and smells, to hear sounds, to see what surrounds us, to feel what touches us, and to transport us from place to place. These functions, in spite of their diversity, tend to two principal objects, and are consequently divided into two classes. The object of one class of functions is the preservation of life of the individual, and are therefore denominated functions of nutrition. The others place the animal in relation with all that surrounds him, and consequently are called functions of relation. The functions of nutrition, as their name implies, all serve in imparting nutrition to the animal, either by separating nutritive matter from the productions of the earth, by modifying the matter, and by reducing it to a fluid or juice fit to be admitted into the organs, or, finally, by conveying into the substance or the organs this nourishing fluid, which by its combinations ensures their maintenance and favors their growth. Consequently, digestion, respiration, and the circulation of the blood belong to this class of functions. The functions of relation are all those which place the animal in relation with the other beings of nature. They are principally the faculties of feeling in different ways and of moving. By the aid of these functions, the animal is enabled to appreciate the form, the color, and the position of objects surrounding him, to hear the sounds which they make, to advance towards or retire from them. In a word, they serve to establish between him and the external world a variety of relations which are as numerous as they are useful. The functions of nutrition are indispensable to the maintenance of life, and they are found in greater or less number in all living or organized beings, and for this reason they are called the functions of organic life or functions of vegetative life. The functions of relation, on the contrary, do not exist in all living beings. Plants have them not. Animals alone possess them, but in losing them, they do not necessarily cease to live. During a part of their existence, they do not exercise them, and this state of repose, or the functions of relation, constitutes sleep. In consequence of these functions, being peculiar to animals, they are also called the functions of animal life. It is now very easy to state, in a few words, the most important differences which exist between vegetables and animals. Vegetables are being constituted for living with the power of nourishing and reproducing themselves. Animals are beings which conformation enables them to live, to be nourished, to reproduce themselves, to feel, and to move. The reader will now easily comprehend the differences between organized beings, as plant and animals, and inorganic bodies, as rocks and minerals, 
which do not possess the power of nourishing and reproducing themselves. The first and most important effects of living organization, for without these effects, death would speedily leave the earth destitute of both animals and plants. We shall first consider those functions which belong to the vegetative life and which have nutrition for their object. End Lesson 1 Lesson 2 Of the Functions of Nutrition Of the Nutritive Act Nutrition is the vital act by which the different parts of the bodies of organized beings renew the materials of which they are composed. To effect this renovation, the animal appropriates certain substances within his reach, which are adapted to this purpose, and these substances, being introduced into the body and distributed to the different organs, are there retained and become constituent parts of them. At the same time that the organs thus acquire new materials, they lose others which, having become old and useless, are in some way detached and expelled. Thus, then, the new materials take the place of those which have been detached from the organ, so that its substance is, little by little, renewed. When a living being thus incorporates with its organs more material than it loses, its volume augments, and, of course, its weight increases. Thus, by the act of nutrition, the infant, which at birth weighed only five or six pounds, is found to have acquired when it has reached the age of twenty-five years, more than a hundred weight, and a proportionate increase in size. But, if the contrary be true, and the living being loses more material than it incorporates with its organs, it grows thin, as is often observed when the adult approaches extreme age, and when these two phenomena are in just equilibrium, its weight remains the same. This nutritive act takes place in all living beings. Brute bodies, as stones and minerals, are not nourished. The materials of which these are composed remain the same as long as they exist, and if their volume increase, it is simply by the juxtaposition of substances of the same nature as their own. But animals and plants, on the contrary, grow by intussusception, that is to say, by the deposit of new particles within their very substance. The continual process of composition and decomposition, which constitutes the nutritive act, is not perceptible to our senses. But observations have been made which remove all doubt of its existence, even in the bones, the hardest and deepest seated parts of the body. An English surgeon, Belcher, eating of a pig which had been fed by a dyer, remarked that the bones of the animal were red, and, attributing this peculiarity to the colored substances which it had eaten, conceived an idea that analogous means might serve to render visible the effects of the nutritive act. He made experiments which, repeated by a number of learned men, were crowned with entire success. After feeding animals on matter for a certain time, it is always found that the bones are stained red, by a deposit of this coloring matter in their substance. And, after having thus fed an animal and then suspending the use of the matter, it is found, after a certain period, that the red matter which must have been deposited in the substance of these organs is no longer there, but has been, as we must conclude, ejected. Now, these facts may be explained by the continuous process of composition and decomposition, to which is given the name of nutrition. This renovation of the constituent materials of the body is indispensable to the continuance of life. When it stops in an organ, that organ decays, and when it ceases throughout, death soon follows. The nutrition of organized bodies is affected by the aid of a liquid which conveys into all the organs the necessary materials for their sustenance, and which serves at the same time to carry away from their substance those particles which are detached by the nutritive act and destined to be expelled from the body. In plants, this liquid is the sap, and in animals it is the blood. Of the blood. The blood is the nutritive liquid of animals. 
It is this liquid which maintains life in the organs and furnishes them with the materials of which they are composed. The blood is the source of all the humors formed in the body, as the saliva, tears, bile, etc. In man, and all animals resembling him in organization, the blood is red. In a great number of others, it is colorless or of a slight yellow or lilac tint. The animals which have red blood are the mammalia, birds, reptiles, fishes, and certain worms called the annelides. The animals with white blood are the insects, the arachnids, that is, spiders and other animals resembling them, the crustacea, a class of animals composed of crabs, lobsters, etc., the mollusca, or animals resembling snails and oysters, and some others. It is a vulgar error to suppose that flies have red blood in the head. When one of these animals is crushed, we see, it is true, an effusion of reddish liquid. But this is not blood, and comes from the eyes of these little beings, whose blood, like that of all insects, is white. Blood is more or less thick and opaque. When examined by a microscope, we perceive that it is formed of two distinct parts, namely, first, of a yellowish transparent liquid called serum, second, of a great number of solid particles of extremely small size which swim in the serum, and which are called the globules of the blood. To these globules, the blood is indebted for its red color. They are flattened and have a considerable resemblance to small pieces of money slightly drilled out in the middle. Their form and size vary in different animals. In man, the dog, the horse, and all other animals of the class of mammalia, the globules of the blood are circular. In birds, reptiles, and fishes, the globules are of an oval form. They are smallest in the mammalia and largest in reptiles and fishes. The blood of the mammalia and birds contains the greatest number of globules. In animals with white blood, the globules are colorless, generally circular, and very few in number. When these globules are carefully examined, with a powerful microscope, it is seen that each one is composed of two distinct parts, and that they consist of a sort of bladder or a membranous sac, in the middle of which there is found a spheroidal corpuscule, a diminutive body. Under ordinary circumstances, this bladder is flattened, and forms, around a central nucleus, a circular border, of greater or less depth, so that, as a whole, it presents the appearance of a disc, swelled or bulged in the middle. The external envelope of the globules consists of a sort of jelly, which is of a more or less beautiful red color, and is easily divided. It is to the presence of these vesicles, little bladders, that the blood owes its color. The central nucleus of the globules is more consistent and is not colored. In its ordinary state, the blood is always fluid, and the globules swim freely in the serum. But when drawn from the vessels which contain it and left to itself, it is not slow to congeal and to present the phenomenon of coagulation. When blood coagulates, the globules unite themselves together in a mass and little by little separate from the serum to form a clot more or less solid. Chemistry teaches us that in man, 100 parts of blood contain about 66 parts of water, from 6 to 7 hundredths of albumen, from 14 to 15 hundredths of fibrin and coloring matter, some thousandths of fatty matters, of several salts, and traces of peroxide of iron. Under ordinary circumstances, we cannot discover in the blood those substances which are found in the different humors formed at its expense. But if we arrest the action of those organs that are charged with secreting these humors, we then find in the blood the matters in question. We must therefore conclude that they always exist in it, but in quantities too small to be appreciated by our methods of analysis, and that the organs just alluded to do not form them, but separate them from the blood in proportion as they are presented. The blood contains all the materials necessary to the reparation and growth of the organs. Consequently, 
It furnishes to all parts the matter of which they are in need for their nourishment, and also imparts the excitement necessary to the maintenance of life. To appreciate fully the importance of the office filled by the blood in the bodies of living animals, it is only necessary to bleed one and observe the effects of the operation. When the flow of blood continues for a long time, the animal falls into syncope, fainting, and if the bleeding be not arrested, all motion ceases in a few moments, respiration is stopped, and life is no longer manifest by external sign. If the animal be left in this condition, reality soon takes the place of appearance, and death speedily follows. But if we inject into his veins blood similar to that which he has lost, we see with astonishment this semblance of a corpse return to life, in proportion as additional quantities of blood are introduced into the vessels, he revives more and more, and soon breathes freely, moves with facility, resumes his habitual gait, and is completely re-established. This operation, known under the name of transfusion, is certainly one of the most remarkable that has been performed, and proves, better than all we could say, the importance of the action of the globules of the blood upon the living organs. For if we make use of serum, that is, blood deprived of its globules, in the same manner, we produce no more effect than if we had used pure water, and death is not a less inevitable consequence of the hemorrhage. The influence of the blood upon the nutrition of the organs may be demonstrated with equal facility. When by mechanical means we diminish, in an appreciable and permanent degree, the quantity of this fluid received by an organ, we perceive that it dwindles in size, and often even decays and becomes reduced to almost nothing. On the other hand, we observe that the more any one part of the body is exercised, the greater the quantity of blood it receives, and the more it augments in volume. Indeed, everyone knows that muscular exercise tends most to the development of those parts which are the seat of it, that in dancers, for example, the muscles of the legs, the calf in particular, acquire an extraordinary size, while with bakers and other men who perform hard labor with their arms, the superior members or extremities become more fleshy than any other parts. Now the muscles receive more blood when in action than when in repose, and by this afflux of blood the nutritive act of which they are the seat is stimulated and their volume is increased. The blood in giving nourishment to the organs and in exciting the vital movement undergoes a change. It is impoverished not only by the deposit of the particles which the organs appropriate to themselves and incorporate with their substance, but also by receiving the old materials, which are separated from the tissue of these same organs, and which, having become useless or even injurious, have to be expelled from the body. Consequently, there is a very great difference between the blood going to the organs and that which has already passed through them, and which has contributed to their nourishment. To the first is given the name of arterial blood, and to the second, the name of venous blood. Arterial blood is of a vermilion red. It coagulates very easily and contains a large proportion of globules. And finally, it is essentially necessary to the maintenance of life. Venous blood is of a blackish red color. It is less coagulable and less rich than the arterial blood. But what distinguishes it above every other quality is that after having passed through them, it is no longer capable of exciting the vital movement in the organs. Notwithstanding, the blood thus vitiated does not cease to be useful because it easily regains its vivifying qualities. By action of the air, the venous blood is changed into arterial blood. It regains its vermilion color and becomes again fit for the maintenance of life. It is this transformation of venous blood into arterial blood which constitutes the phenomenon of respiration. End of Lesson 2 Lesson 3 Circulation of the blood. The blood does not remain at rest in the body. It is constantly passing through the organs which it nourishes, 
and returning to the respiratory apparatus to come in contact with the air to be again distributed to the organs. The continuous passage of the blood from the respiratory apparatus towards all the organs of the body and the return of the blood from these organs to the apparatus of respiration constitutes the phenomenon of the circulation. This liquid, as we have seen, moves continually in a sort of circle. After having traversed all the parts which it is destined to nourish, it returns to a particular organ to come in contact with the air, then goes back to the parts whence it came, passes through them, returns again to the apparatus of respiration, and so continues as long as life endures. The apparatus of the circulation, that is to say, the assemblage of organs destined to effect this conveyance or transportation of the blood, is composed, first, of canals or pipes in which the blood runs, second, of the heart, which serves to set it in motion. The heart is the center of the apparatus of the circulation. It is a sort of fleshy pouch communicating with the blood vessels, which receiving the blood into its interior, and which by contracting on itself from time to time, forces this fluid into the canals, and thus keeps up a continual current in them. Almost all animals have a heart. This organ exists not only in the mammalia, birds, reptiles, and fishes, but also in snails, oysters, and other animals of the class of mollusca, in crabs and lobsters, in spiders, etc. The blood vessels are of two kinds, namely, first, the arteries, which carry the blood from the heart to all parts of the body, second, the veins, which bring this liquid back from all parts of the body to the heart. The arteries spring from the heart and divide into branches which decrease in size and increase in number as they advance and are distributed to the very numerous parts distant from the heart. The veins present a similar disposition, but which is designed to produce an entirely opposite result, because the blood in these vessels pursues an inverse course. They are very numerous at a distance from the heart, but little by little they unite to form larger canals which, in turn, again unite so that they terminate at the heart in only one or two large trunks. The ultimate ramifications of the arteries in the substance of the organs are continued into the radicals of the veins, so as to form a series of uninterrupted and narrow canals through which the blood passes through the organs. To these delicate canals which establish the communication between the termination of the arteries and the beginning of the veins is applied to the name of capillary vessels. This name has been given to them in consideration of their extreme fineness, which makes them comparable to hairs. At the extremity opposite to that where we find the capillary vessels, the arteries and veins also communicate with each other by the intervention of the cavities of the heart. The result of this arrangement is that the vascular apparatus forms a complete circle in which the blood moves, constantly returning to its point of departure. The circulating circle may be compared to a tree, the trunk of which is doubled upon itself, so as to cause the ultimate ramifications of the branches to meet the ultimate divisions of the roots. The upper portion of the trunk and roots would represent the veins. In all those animals which most resemble man, anatomically, such as the monkey, the dog, horse, ox, etc., the heart is placed between the two lungs, in the cavity of the chest, which anatomists call the thorax. The general form of the heart is that of an inverted cone, the apex down and a little to the left. The size of the heart is very nearly that of the fist of the individual to whom it belongs. This organ is enveloped in a double membranous sac called pericardium and is suspended in the pericardium by the vessels which arise from its superior and enlarged entremity, but it does not adhere at any other point of its surface to the neighboring parts. The substance of the heart is almost entirely fleshy. It is a hollow muscle, the cavity of which communicates with the arteries and veins. In man and all the mammalia, as well as birds, it has four distinct cavities. A thick vertical partition divides it into two halves, each one forming two cavities, one above the other, a ventricle and an auricle. The two ventricles occupy the inferior part of the heart and do not communicate with each other, but each one opens into the auricle above it. The cavities of the left side of the heart contain arterial blood, and those of the right side, venous blood. The vessels which convey arterial blood into all the organs take their origin from the left ventricle of the heart, through the medium of a single trunk called the aorta. This great artery first mounts upwards toward the base of the neck, then bends downwards, forming a sort of crook, passes behind the heart, and descends vertically, 
in front of the spine to the lower part of the belly. In its course, the aorta gives off a great number of branches, the principal of which are, first, the two carotid arteries, mount along the sides of the neck and supply the head with blood. Second, the two arteries of the upper extremities successively obtain the names of subclavian, axillary, and brachial arteries as they pass under the clavicle or cross the armpit or descend along the arm to the elbow where they divide into two branches called the radial and ulnar or cubital arteries. Third, the intercostal arteries are several in number and run between the ribs on each side of the body. Fourth, the celiac artery, which is distributed to the stomach, the liver, and the spleen. Fifth, the mesenteric arteries, which ramify upon the intestines. Sixth, the renal arteries, which penetrate into the kidneys. And seventh, the iliac arteries, which in a manner terminate the aorta and which convey blood to the lower extremities, descend along the thighs, and are there called femoral arteries. Then they divide into many branches which terminate in the feet. The veins which receive the blood thus transmitted to all parts of the body follow very nearly the same course as the arteries, but they are larger, more numerous, and generally situated more superficially. A great number of these vessels pass beneath the skin, others accompany the arteries, and at last they all unite to form two great trunks which empty into the right oracle of the heart and which have received the names of vena cava superior and vena cava inferior. The veins which come from the intestines present an important peculiarity. After uniting in a large trunk, they penetrate the liver and there ramify like the arteries. There they again unite into a trunk and terminate in the inferior vena cava close to the heart. This arrangement of the vessels is called the system of the vena porta. The venous blood poured by the vena cava into the right oracle of the heart descends from it into the ventricle of the same side. The right ventricle of the heart gives rise to a large artery called the pulmonary artery, which next receives this same blood and carries it into the lungs. This vessel divides into two branches, one going to the right and the other to the left, to enter the two corresponding lungs, and are divided into an almost infinity of branches, which are spread over the surface of the little membranous cells of these organs. The capillary vessels by which the pulmonary arteries terminate give rise to veins, which unite together and finally form two large vessels, called pulmonary veins, which empty into the left oracle of the heart. Consequently, the pulmonary veins receive the venous blood, which was brought to the lungs by the pulmonary artery, and which has now become arterial by the effect produced on it, by contact with the air in the interior of these organs. They carry it back again to the heart and pour it into the left oracle. Finally, from the left oracle, this fluid descends into the left ventricle, whence we have already seen it issue to be distributed to the different parts of the body through the medium of the aorta and its branches. To recapitulate what has just been said, on the route pursued by the blood in the apparatus of the circulation in mammiferous animals and birds, we see, first, that the venous blood arrives from all parts of the body by the general system of veins. Second, that from these veins it enters the right oracle of the heart. Third, that from the right oracle it passes into the right ventricle. Fourth, that from the right ventricle the venous blood passes through the pulmonary artery to the lungs. Fifth, that in the capillary vessels which form the termination of the pulmonary artery and commencement of the pulmonary veins, this liquid is changed into arterial blood. Sixth, that this arterial blood returns from the lungs through the pulmonary veins and enters the left oracle of the heart. Seventh, that from the left oracle it descends into the ventricle of the same side. Eighth, that from the left ventricle it is forced into the aorta by which it is distributed to all parts of the body. And ninth, and finally, that in the capillary terminations of the system of canals formed by the aorta, the arterial blood acts upon the organs is changed there into venous blood and enters the veins to be carried again to the heart. In accomplishing the circulatory circle, the blood then passes twice through the heart, in the state of venous blood on the right side and in the state of arterial blood in the left side of this organ. Yet the circulation is complete, because the pulmonary and aortic cavities of the heart 
do not open one into the other, and the venous blood passes through the entire respiratory apparatus to be transmuted into arterial blood. The mechanism by which the blood moves through these vessels is easily understood. The cavities of the heart contract and enlarge alternately, and by contracting they force the blood into the canals with which they, the cavities, are in communication. The two ventricles contract at the same time, and while their sides or parietes relax, the auricles in their turn contract. The movement of contraction bears the name of systole, and the term diastole is applied to the opposite movement, or dilatation. The beating or pulsation of the heart is very frequent. In man of adult age, it takes place from 60 to 75 times in a minute. In old men, the number of beats is a little increased, and in very young infants, it is generally about 120. But a variety of circumstances may influence both the frequency and force of the beats of the heart. They are accelerated by exercise, by moral emotions, and by a great number of diseases. In swooning or syncope, they are considerably diminished, or even completely interrupted. The left ventricle in dilating fills with blood, and in contracting afterwards, forces out the liquid which it contains. This ventricle communicates only with the left auricle by an opening called the auriculoventricular opening and with the aorta. The blood at the moment of its contraction must then either flow back into the auricle or enter the aorta. Now, around the edges of this auriculoventricular opening, there is a sort of valve called the mitral valve which is so arranged as to rise up and close this opening when it is pushed from below upwards. From this construction, it happens that when the blood tends towards entering the auricle, the mitral valve is pushed up and interrupts the communication between the auricle and ventricle. Therefore, when the left ventricle contracts, the blood finds no other outlet than the aorta and enters this vessel, which it distends with more or less force for its parietes, as well as those of all the arteries, are very elastic. Other valves, situate at the entrance of the aorta, prevent the blood from returning into the left ventricle, so that, pressed by the elastic force of the arterial parietes, it is continually pushed forward from the heart towards the extremities of the arteries. The phenomenon known under the name of the pulse is nothing else than the motion caused by the pressure of the blood against the parietes of the arteries every time that the heart contracts. According to the frequency and force of these motions, we may judge of the manner in which the organ beats, and draw therefrom deductions useful in medicine. But the pulse is not felt in all parts. To perceive it, we must slightly compress an artery of a certain volume between the finger and a resisting surface, of a bone, for example, and select a vessel situated near the skin as the radial artery at the wrist. The impulsion received by the blood at its exit from the left ventricle of the heart is communicated to the capillary vessels and to the veins and determines the progression of the blood in them. But the return of the venous blood towards the right ventricle is favored by some other circumstances. In the veins of the extremities, the membrane which lines these vessels forms a great many folds or valves which open when the blood pushes them from the extremities towards the heart, and shut so as to close the passage when this fluid flows in a contrary direction. Now this arrangement prevents the blood from flowing back towards the capillaries, and thus facilitates its passage towards the heart, for every time a vein is pressed by the movements of the parts in its vicinity, the blood is pushed forward. The passage of the blood through the right cavities of the heart is effected in the same manner as in the left cavities. Between the right auricle and right ventricle, there also exists a valve, called the tricuspid valve, which prevents the blood from returning from the ventricle into the auricle. And by the contractions of this ventricle, the blood is forced to circulate in the vessels of the lungs and to arrive at the left auricle. It is the ventricles, as we have seen, which force the blood into the arteries and cause it to circulate. The auricles are a sort of reservoirs, designed to contain the blood arriving by the veins and to pour it into the corresponding ventricles. Such is the march of the blood, not only in man and all the mammalia, but also in birds. In the sequel, we shall see that in reptiles and fishes, the structure of the heart is less complicated, 
and that the blood follows a somewhat different direction. Of Absorption The blood, in passing through the veins from their capillary origin in the substance of the organs to their termination in the right oracle of the heart, carries with it all the fluids which in some way filter through the parietes of these vessels. Fluid substances which may be in contact with the surface of the body and of the great hollow cavities in its interior, or which are deposited in the depth of the organs, are, as it were, pumped up more or less rapidly and carried into the torrent of the circulation. To the passage of substances, of whatever kind, from the exterior into the interior of the blood vessels, through their parietes, or particular canals, and their mixture with the blood, is given the name of absorption. Substances thus absorbed generally penetrate directly into the veins, but under some circumstances they are carried thither by particular canals called lymphatic vessels. In describing the act of digestion, we shall have occasion to refer again to these vessels. All parts of the body may be the seat of a more or less rapid absorption. It is by this phenomenon that liquids introduced into the stomach are found, a very short time afterwards, mingled with the venous blood, and that certain vapors mixed with the air drawn into the lungs sometimes act upon remote parts of the body, such as the brain, as happens when we breathe alcoholic vapors. It is also by absorption alone that we can explain how poisons applied to the lips, the eye, or to a slight erosion of the skin penetrate into the interior of the body and cause death, often with as much rapidity as if they had been conveyed directly into the stomach. It is by the absorption which takes place in the substance of all the organs that the old materials, no longer of use and separated from the living tissues by the nutritive act, are poured into the circulating torrent to be carried out of the body. Of Exhalation and of Secretion The blood in circulating through the body is not limited to the nutrition of the organs through which it passes and to mingling with it absorbed matters. On passing into certain parts of the body, it abandons a portion of the matters which it contains and in this way gives birth to the peculiar liquids called humors. This separation of the contained matters from the blood may take place in two ways, by exhalation and by secretion. Exhalation is the separation of a portion of the most aqueous part of the blood, which in some manner filters through the parietes of the vessels. The exhaled liquids do not differ much from serum, except that they contain more water. Sometimes they accumulate in the internal cavities of the body, at others they are diffused over the surface and are evaporated into the air. It is in this way that a considerable quantity of vapor escapes from the lungs, and a very active evaporation takes place upon the surface of the skin. Secretion is the production of certain liquids which resemble the serum in nothing, and which are also formed at the expense of the blood. Tears, saliva, bile, urine, etc., are liquids secreted in this way. The phenomenon of secretion always takes place in particular organs. Sometimes it is seated in the follicles, and sometimes in the glands. The follicles are very small pouches which are strewed through substance of the membranes and which open upon their surface by small pores. The follicles of the skin secrete the sweat, those on the edge of the eyelids which secrete the yellow matter which sometimes accumulates during sleep are organs of this kind. The glands are more voluminous organs composed of small granulations united in a compact and distinct mass. These granulations are the seat of secretion and they generally communicate externally by small tubes or conduits, which uniting together like the roots of a tree, finally form an excretory canal by which the secreted liquid is poured out. The salivary glands, which secrete the saliva, the lacrimal glands, which secrete the tears, and the liver, which secretes the bile, are organs of this class. The act of secretion is not designed simply to produce liquids useful in the exercise of certain functions, such as the saliva and bile, but also to free the blood from the old materials, separated from the tissue of the organs by the act of nutrition, and other useless or injurious matters, which may become mixed with it by the effect of absorption. The secretion of urine, which takes place in the kidneys, situated in the abdomen, one on each side of the spine, and the expulsion of it which follows, 
is the principal means by which this sort of purification of the blood is effected. End of Lesson 3 Lesson 4 Functions of Nutrition Respiration Necessity of Contact with Air Asphyxia Composition of the Atmosphere Principal Phenomena of Respiration The Lungs Mechanism of Respiration Animal Heat We have already seen that the arterial blood by its action upon the living tissues, loses those qualities which make it fit for the support of animal life, and after having been in this way vitiated, it regains its first properties by contact with air. The transformation of venous into arterial blood, by the action of the air, constitutes the phenomenon of respiration respiration, and consequently contact with the air, is indispensable to all living beings. Plants, as well as animals, feel the want of it, and, when deprived of it, both very soon perish. When from any cause whatever respiration is arrested, all the animal functions are disturbed. Life soon ceases to be manifest, the animal falls into a state of asphyxia, or apparent death, and in a very short time life becomes entirely extinct. At first sight, we might believe that animals which live in the depths of the waters, as fishes, are removed from the influence of the air, and consequently form an exception to the law of which we have spoken. But it is not so for the liquid in which they dwell absorbs and holds in solution a certain quantity of air which may be easily separated from it and which is sufficient for the support of life in them it is impossible for them to exist in water deprived of its air and they are seen to become asphyxiated and die just as the mammiferae and birds do when excluded from the action of the atmospheric air under its ordinary form. In man, and in other mammalia, the apparatus of respiration consists first of the lungs, organs which are the seat of this function, second of canals by which the air from without is conveyed into the lungs, third of organs which affect the entrance of the air into this apparatus and which afterwards expel it to make room for fresh supplies of this fluid the lungs figure eleven are very elastic spongy organs contained in the cavity of the chest and formed by the union of a great number of membranous vesicles resembling little cells which generally communicate with one another into these vesicles is introduced the external air. When it penetrates their cavities, it distends them, and thus augments the entire volume of the lung, which happens in inspiration. On the contrary, when the lungs are emptied of the air, which distends them, their volume diminishes, as happens in expiration. The lungs communicate with the external air, by a long canal, which is terminated by the mouth and nose. The air to reach these organs passes through the nasal fossae, or nostrils, or through the mouth into the pharynx, then enters into the larynx, descends along the trachea, or windpipe, and is distributed to the pulmonary cells by other canals or tubes called bronchae. The nasal fossae and the mouth terminate internally in the pharynx, or gullet, so that the supply of air necessary for respiration may reach this cavity by either root. At the bottom of the pharynx, or swallow, we find an opening called the glottis, which leads into the larynx and permits the air to enter therein. The larynx is a short tube of considerable diameter situated at the superior and anterior part of the neck, and which contributes to the production of the voice. 
the larynx is prolonged inferiorly into a long tube called the trachea or windpipe which descends through the neck and enters into the thorax this tube is formed by a series of cartilaginous rings and is lined internally by a thin membrane which also lines the larynx and is continuous with that of the pharynx the cartilaginous rings of the trachea are very elastic and prevent this air canal from being effaced that is from having its sides pressed together and thus offer an obstacle to the passage of the air at its lower extremity the trachea is divided into two branches one going to each of the two lungs they are called bronchia soon after they enter the lungs these bronchia are subdivided and ramify into almost infinity of branches so as to furnish every pulmonary cell with a little branch which opens into it and conveys there the air necessary to respiration the instrument which causes the air to pass through these tubes and to enter the lungs or to go out from them is the thorax figure twelve the mechanism by which this phenomenon is produced is very simple, and, in almost every respect, resembles the play of a pair of bellows, except that the air escapes by the same passage that it entered the lungs, which is not the case in the bellows. The lungs are lodged in a great cavity called the chest, or thorax, the sides of which are movable, so arranged as to enlarge and diminish the size of the cavity alternately. The lungs follow these motions and dilate and contract in consequence. Now in the first case, when the thorax dilates, the air, pressed by all the weight of the surrounding atmosphere, is forced into the chest and through the mouth or nostrils and trachea, and fills the pulmonary cells in the same way that water mounts in the body of a pump when the piston is raised. In the second case, in the act of expiration, the air contained in the lungs is on the contrary compressed, and partially escapes by the route which served it for entrance. The cavity of the thorax, figure 13, is formed principally by the ribs, which are attached posteriorly to the spine or vertebral column and in front to the bone of the sternum the spaces which exist between the ribs are filled up by muscles and below this species of chamber is separated from the belly by a fleshy partition called the diaphragm inspiration or the enlargement of the chest is produced in two ways first by the elevation of the ribs second by the muscular contraction of the diaphragm which in a state of repose rises into the chest in the form of an arch and which in contracting is lowered down expiration or contraction of the chest on the contrary is produced by the depression of the ribs and relaxation of the diaphragm we observe many degrees in the extent of these movements and in ordinary respiration the quantity of air received into or expelled from the lungs does not much exceed one-seventh part of what these organs are capable of containing the number of respiratory movements varies in different individuals according to the age in adult age we count about twenty inspirations a minute in infancy they are much more frequent we have seen that it is by the nose or mouth the pharynx the larynx the trachea and the bronchia that the air enters into the lungs the venous blood which is to be subjected to the salutary influence of this air arrives at the same time in little vessels which ramify in every direction over the sides of the cells Consequently, it is through the very sides of these capillary vessels that the air acts upon this fluid. The blood coming to the lungs is of a blackish-red color, and it is not fit to support life in the organs. But so soon as it comes into contact with the air, it changes its nature, 
its color becomes a bright red regains its vivifying properties and acquires all the characteristics of arterial blood the atmospheric air which thus enters into the lungs and there produces so remarkable a phenomenon is chiefly composed of two substances which differ very much from each other namely oxygen and azote or nitrogen though the oxygen which enters into the composition of the air forms about one-fifth twenty-one parts in the hundred it is its most important part it is to the oxygen that the air owes its property of supporting life and of sustaining the burning of combustible bodies when inflamed azote or nitrogen which enters into the composition of the air in the proportion of seventy-nine parts in a hundred is unfit for respiration and incapable of supporting combustion it seems to serve only to dilute the oxygen and thus mitigate the otherwise too irritating action of this gas by being breathed the air changes its nature its oxygen disappears little by little and is replaced by another fluid called carbonic acid gas this carbonic acid gas is composed of oxygen combined with carbon derived from the blood instead of being fit to support life it acts as a poison on animals that breathe it for a short time and causes death on this account by the respiration of animals the air is gradually vitiated and if it were not renewed would soon occasion asphyxia carbonic acid gas which extinguishes bodies in combustion in the same way as azote is formed by the combustion of charcoal also during the fermentation of wine and of beer which makes it sparkling and frothy it is upon the action of this gas on the animal economy that the asphyxia produced by the vapor of charcoal depends as well as the greater number of accidents of the same sort which occur in mines caves wells and vats wherein wine or beer is fermenting in a grotto near naples this gas is continuously disengaged from the earth and give rise to phenomena which at first sight appear very singular and excite the admiration of the traveller when a man enters this cavern he experiences no inconvenience in his respiration but a dog following him very soon falls down in a state of asphyxia at his feet and would soon expire were he not speedily removed to the pure air this arises from the fact that the carbonic acid gas being much heavier than the air sinks down and forms upon the bottom of the cave a bed or stratum of about two feet thick now a dog that enters the grotto is necessarily plunged over his head into this mephitic gas and must necessarily become asphyxiate while a man who is very much taller only has the lower part of his body exposed to the action of the carbonic acid and breathes freely the air which floats above this remarkable place is known under the name of the grotto del cano or dog's grotto the air which escapes from the lungs is composed of the nitrogen inspired of a portion of oxygen not employed and of carbonic acid furnished by the act of respiration the expired air is also loaded with vapor of water exhaled from the blood during its passage through the capillary vessels of the lungs this vapor becomes very perceptible when the cold condenses it at the moment of its issue from the body and constitute what physiologists call pulmonary transpiration since the air is quickly vitiated by respiration and its oxygen disappears to be replaced by the carbonic acid we readily infer that this fluid must be constantly renewed in the lungs and in fact that this takes place in consequence of the alternate movements of inspiration and expiration we are informed of the degree of alteration which the air has undergone in our lungs by the sensation which induces us to renew it 
this sensation scarcely appreciable in ordinary respiration because we hasten to comply with the necessity of frequently renewing the air becomes painful if not promptly satisfied and is sometimes accompanied by anxiety and even agony an instructive warning of the imperious necessity of respiration in man there is commonly twenty inspirations per minute in all the mammalia in birds and in reptiles respiration takes place in lungs and very nearly in the same manner as in man in the greater number of aquatic animals such as fishes lobsters oysters etc it is altogether different and respiration takes place through the medium of a sort of membranous fringes called branchiae we shall recur to this in the sequel the air necessary to the support of life in insects penetrates into all parts of their bodies through particular canals called trachea. Finally, there are some animals which have neither lungs nor branchia nor trachea, in which respiration is accomplished by the surface of the skin. The earthworm is an example of this kind. The greater number of animals appear cold when we touch them and indeed the temperature of their bodies is not much above that of the atmosphere and changes with it in man and in other animals that approach him in their organization it is otherwise they have the faculty of producing a sufficient quantity of calorie to maintain their temperatures nearly always at the same degree under all atmospheric changes and keep themselves warm we designate under the name of cold-blooded animals all those whose proper heat is not very perceivable and call those warm-blooded animals which produce sufficient heat independently of the atmosphere surrounding them the production of this heat which is called animal heat seems to depend upon the act of respiration the combination of the oxygen of the air with the venous blood in the interior of the lungs as we have already seen causes the formation of certain quantity of carbonic acid gas in the same manner as in the case where oxygen combines with carbon in producing the phenomenon of combustion and in both instances must extricate a greater or lesser quantity of heat the faculty of thus producing heat is common to all animals but the greater part of them develop it in so small a degree that it is not appreciable by our ordinary thermometers, while in others it is so great that we do not require physical instruments to ascertain its existence. The only warm-blooded animals are the mammalia and birds. All the rest are cold-blooded. The temperature of the body of man is about 101 degrees of Fahrenheit, it is about the same in other mammalia, but birds produce more heat, their temperature rising to about 108 degrees Fahrenheit. End of Lesson 4 Lesson 5 Functions of Nutrition Digestion, Mouth, the Prehension of Elements, Mastication, Teeth, Their Structure, The Manner of Their Formation, Their Form and Use, saliva salivary glands deglutition pharynx esophagus one the blood as we have seen in nourishing all the organs it may be said loses somewhat of its properties and requires to retrieve the losses which it thus undergoes now it is renewed by receiving new materials from the productions of the earth too these materials destined to the support of the blood and consequently to the support of the whole body are furnished by the various elements or food three that they may be nourished all living beings require that alimentary substance should be introduced into their bodies from time to time four plants pump up by their roots the elements furnished them by the earth and these matters are mingled with the nutritious liquid called sap which permeates throughout their tissues without having undergone any preparation five with animals it is altogether different 
the elements previously to being absorbed and diffused through the different parts of the body to afford nourishment to the organs and to enter into the composition of their tissues have to undergo a certain process of preparation called digestion six digestion has for its object first to separate from alimentary substances the nutritive part from that which is not second to transform this nutritive part into a peculiar liquid fit to mix with the blood and nourish the organs which liquid is called chyle seven the process of digestion always takes place in a cavity situated in the interior of the body and communicating externally in such a way that aliments may enter it eight all animals are provided with a digestive cavity nine plants on the contrary having no need to digest elements have no such cavity the elementary surface of a plant is the exterior of its root spread out in the earth ten in some animals the digestive cavity is simply a pouch communicating externally by a single opening which performs the functions both of a mouth and of an anus eleven but with the greatest number it is otherwise the digestive cavity has the form of a tube open at its two ends and enlarged about the middle this enlarged portion of the digestive tube is named stomach and serves to contain the elements while the greatest part of the process of digestion is performed twelve the superior opening of this tube is the mouth it is through it that food enters the digestive cavity the inferior opening called anus is destined as an outlet to matters unfit for nutrition which are separated from the food by digestion thirteen in quadrupeds and most other animals we distinguish in this alimentary tube diverse portions the uses of which are different they are first the mouth second the pharynx or swallow third the esophagus fourth the stomach fifth the intestine fourteen other organs or instruments also concur to effect the digestion of food and constitute with the tube of which we have just spoken the digestive apparatus the principal are first the teeth destined to divide and grind the food second certain glands such as the liver and salivary glands serve to form the humours which act upon the food in order to determine its digestion third of particular vessels destined to pump into the intestine the nutritious juices produced by digestion and to mix them with the blood in short we might consider as being in some sort auxiliary to the digestive apparatus certain organs with which certain animals seize their food and introduce it into the mouth but these instruments principally serve other purposes and do not really belong to the apparatus of digestion fifteen the process of digestion is very complicated and is made up of several phenomena or distinct acts which take place in different parts of the digestive apparatus and which have for instruments particular organs sixteen these phenomena are first the prehension of aliments second mastication third insalivation fourth deglutition fifth chymification or stomach digestion sixth chylification or intestinal digestion seventh absorption of chyle eighth the expulsion of the residue left by the aliments after digestion is finished we will now study successively these different phenomena and the organs which produce them of the prehension of elements seventeen the first phenomenon of the process of digestion is the prehension of elements that is the act of seizing them and introducing them into the mouth eighteen the mouth is a cavity of an oval form closed in front by the lips on the sides by the cheeks and jaws above by the palate and below by the tongue behind it is continuous with the pharynx or swallow but is separated from it by a kind of curtain called 
the velum palati veil of the palate and which may be elevated or depressed so as to close the passage or leave it free nineteen the entrance of the mouth may be closed or opened by movements of the jaw and lips on the prehension of aliment the latter are separated to permit the entrance of the substance and are immediately afterwards closed to prevent its escape twenty with most animals the prehension of aliments is performed by the lips and jaws alone but with some other organs are employed to seize the substances and convey them to the mouth with man and monkeys the hand thus becomes the chief instrument of the prehension of aliments with the elephant it is his trunk and with parrots the claw twenty one with most animals the food remains for some time in the mouth to be chewed and mixed with saliva of mastication twenty two liquid aliments may be immediately swallowed but solid food to be swallowed and digested with facility should be previously divided into very small morsels twenty three this division called mastication is effected by the aid of the teeth which set in motion by the jaws press upon the food and cut or crush it twenty four in man and those animals which in their organization resemble us most the two jaws are situated one above the other the upper jaw is fixed immovably to the cranium but the lower jaw is only attached to it at its posterior part and is there held on each side by a sort of hinge or joint which permits it to be separated from and approached to the upper jaw twenty five the muscles which serve to bring the jaws together and which consequently act most during mastication are placed on each side of the head in front of the ear and when we press the teeth together we can feel that they contract twenty six in most mammalia the edges of the jaws are armed with teeth twenty seven the teeth are small bodies of great hardness which resemble bone very much they are planted in holes hollowed into the jaws which holes are named alveoli twenty eight the fibrous pads which cover the edge of the jaws and which are called gums serve as well as the alveoli to fix the teeth solidly in the position which they occupy twenty nine generally each tooth is divided into two parts one is situated without and called the crown the other buried in the alveolus and terminated by one or more points is called the root of the tooth finally we often remark between the crown and the root a slight shrinking called the neck of the tooth thirty the teeth are composed of an internal substance called ivory and a sort of extremely hard stony varnish which covers the surface and is called enamel thirty one the crown of the tooth only is covered with enamel the root has it not thirty two the teeth are formed in the interior of the jaws and within little membranous pouches called dental capsules which are enclosed within the substance of the bone and which present in their interior a fleshy bud or granule from the surface of which exudes the stony matter of which the tooth is composed thirty three this stony matter is the ivory it moulds itself upon the bud and takes its form just in proportion as new quantities of ivory are deposited upon that already formed the tooth enlarges as well as the species of case which it forms around the bud which shrinks away until finally the little organ being too much compressed disappears the tooth then ceases to grow thirty four in proportion as the tooth is formed as we have just said it rises in the alveolus passes through the gum and shows itself without thirty five the enamel is formed at the superior portion of the dental capsule and is applied upon the tooth just to the extent it traverses that part of the capsule it is for this reason that the root which remains at the bottom of the alveolus is never covered by it thirty six the teeth which are formed in the earliest period of life are destined soon to fall and to give place to other teeth stronger and more solidly fixed the first are called milk teeth 
or deciduous teeth or teeth of the first dentition the second the permanent teeth or teeth of second dentition thirty seven the teeth are divided into three kinds namely thirty eight first the incisive or incisor which occupy the front of the mouth and terminate in a thin cutting edge have but one simple root and are fit for cutting the various elements thirty nine second the canine which are placed on each side and next to the incisors are in general long and pointed they also have only a single root but it penetrates deeply into the jaw their principal use is to fix themselves in the flesh upon which the animal feeds and to tear it forty third the molar teeth or grinders which are next to the canine occupy the sides of the mouth they are generally provided with several roots and present a large unequal crown appropriate for grinding the food forty one the molar teeth are subdivided into false molar dentes biscupendi and great molar the first are smaller than the second and are situated in front of them the roots of the great molars are also more numerous which gives them more solidity and power forty two the number of teeth varies in different animals man monkeys the dog the cat and so forth have the three sorts of teeth we have just described but with the rabbit the rat and the other gnawers rodentia the canine teeth are wanting and in other quadrupeds such as the sloth there are no incisors finally there are also animals that are entirely unprovided with teeth the anteater and birds for example forty three the form of the teeth also varies in different animals and we remark that these differences are in accordance with the nature or kind of aliment upon which these beings are destined to be nourished forty four thus with the dog the cat and other carnivorous animals the molar teeth are sharp and fitted to cut flesh like scissors with the mole and hedgehog that live upon pretty hard insects these teeth are armed with conical points which dovetail or fit reciprocally and enable these animals to crush their prey with facility with the frugivorous animals monkeys for example the same teeth are large and their crown is armed with rounded elevations suitable for crushing fruits and with the ox and horse which browse or crop the grass the crown of these teeth is still larger and its surface is flat and striated like a millstone forty five in man the deciduous or milk teeth begin to appear about the sixth or seventh month and fall about the seventh year they are in number twenty namely in each jaw four incisor two canine one on each side and four molar two on each side forty six the permanent or teeth of second dentition are in number thirty two forty seven the incisor and canine are the same in number as in the first dentition but in place of two molars on each side of each jaw there are five the total number of molar teeth in adult man is consequently twenty ten in each jaw forty eight the five molar teeth on each side are divided into two kinds namely two false molars and three great molars of insalivation forty nine during the act of mastication the food is mixed with the saliva which phenomenon is designated under the name of insalivation fifty the saliva is a watery fluid colorless and frothy which is formed in particular organs called salivary glands fifty one in man these glands are six in number three on each side of the face and are called parotid submaxillary and sublingual fifty two the parotid glands are the largest they are placed beneath the skin between the ear and the jaw and empty the saliva into the mouth by a long straight tube which opens on the inside or internal face of the cheeks fifty three the submaxillary glands are smaller than the parotid and are lodged below and behind the lower jaw 
fifty four the sublingual glands are smaller than the preceding and are found under the tongue fifty five the saliva serves to render the deglutition of food more easy and contributes to accelerate digestion of deglutition fifty six the food conveniently prepared by mastication and in salivation unites upon the back of the tongue in a little mass called an alimentary ball or bolus fifty seven the alimentary ball is next swallowed we give the name of deglutition to this phenomenon which consists in the passing of food from the mouth into the stomach through the pharynx and esophagus fifty eight the opening which occupies the back part of the mouth and which forms the communication between this cavity and the pharynx is called the isthmus of the throat isthmus van cecum during mastication it is closed by the veil of the palate velum palati but when deglutition is about to take place this species of curtain is raised and the alimentary ball is pushed into the pharynx fifty nine the pharynx is a cavity situated between the base of the cranium and the front of the neck above it communicates with the nasal fossa by the posterior nares or nostrils a u as well as with the mouth and below it presents two openings one by which it is continuous with the esophagus the other situated in front and called glottis by which it communicates with the larynx and windpipe we may compare it to a cross-road where the route followed by the air to get from the nose to the lungs crosses the route followed by the food to get from the mouth to the esophagus sixty that deglutition may be effected the alimentary ball must pass beneath the posterior nostrils and over the glottis without entering it and descend directly into the esophagus sixty one the veil of the palate by being raised up and placed obliquely against the posterior wall of the pharynx forms beneath the posterior nostrils a sort of screen which hinders the food from mounting upwards and entering the nose from behind during the act of swallowing sixty two that the food may not enter the glottis it closes at the moment of deglutition and at the same time the larynx is raised up against the base of the tongue a movement which forces a valve situated above the glottis and called epiglottis to fall and close the opening sixty three sometimes however deglutition not being properly effected the food penetrates into the larynx and at once brings on a fit of coughing when this happens it is said we swallow crosswise sixty four the esophagus or gullet is continuous with the pharynx it is a long membranous tube which descends from the superior part of the neck behind the windpipe enters the thorax passes behind the heart and lungs pierces the diaphragm and terminates in the stomach sixty five the pharynx and esophagus are furnished with a layer of fleshy fibres which are placed transversely in rings which contracting successively from above downwards convey the alimentary ball into the stomach end of lesson five lesson six functions of nutrition stomach digestion or chymification intestinal digestion or calification bile and liver pancreas and pancreatic juice large intestine absorption of chyle chyliferous vessels recapitulation of the functions of nutrition of stomach digestion or chymification one food begins to be digested in the stomach it is there transformed into chyme and we give to this phenomenon the name of stomach digestion or chymification two the stomach is a membranous pouch placed transversely at the superior part of the abdomen or belly it has the form of a bagpipe and presents two openings one situate to the left and called cardia because it is nearest to the heart 
communicates with the esophagus the other called pylorus from the greek pouloros a gatekeeper because it shuts up the food in the stomach until converted into chyme occupies the right extremity of this organ and empties into the intestines three immediately after the passage of the alimentary ball the cardia closes in such a manner as to hinder it from reascending again to the mouth the pylorus is also closed and the consequence is that the food is arrested in the stomach and forced to remain there a considerable time for while the aliment thus sojourns in the stomach it imbibes a peculiar liquid called gastric juice which converts it into chyme five the gastric juice is a watery and acid liquid which is generated in a great number of very small cavities lodged in the thickness of the parietes or coats of the stomach and named gastric follicles each one of these follicles communicates with the interior of this organ by a small pore and thus empties the gastric juice upon the food six by the action of the gastric juice the food is softened and little by little changed into a thick grayish pap which is called chyme seven as soon as the chyme is formed the pylorus relaxes and the stomach begins to perform a series of movements which by degrees push the alimentary mass towards this opening and then into the intestine these movements consist in the successive contraction of fleshy fibres which surround the stomach transversely and which contract one after the other from left to right of intestinal digestion or chylification eight the chyme which issues from the stomach enters the intestine where it serves to form chyle nine the intestine is a long membranous tube folded upon itself which forms a continuation of the stomach and which by its opposite extremity opens outwardly it is lodged in the abdomen and is retained in its place by folds of a very fine membrane called peritoneum which lines the parietes or walls of this cavity the folds of peritoneum which connect the intestines to the spine bear the name of mesentery ten the parietes of the intestine are furnished with fleshy fibres which surround them and which by contracting successively push forward the matters contained within this tube these movements are called vermiform or vermicular because they resemble those of a worm when crawling eleven the length of the intestine is always very considerable but varies very much in different animals it is remarked that in those which are nourished by flesh exclusively it is much shorter than in those which live on vegetable substances thus in the lion which is essentially carnivorous it is only three times the length of the body while in man who is omnivorous its length is about six or seven times that of the body and in the sheep which eats grass only it is just twenty-eight times this length twelve the intestine is composed of two very distinct portions the small intestine and large intestine thirteen the small intestine is next to the stomach it is narrower than the large intestine and its external surface is smooth its length is very considerable and it is subdivided into three portions called duodenum jejunum and ileum fourteen in the small intestine the chyle is formed and digestion finished fifteen the phenomenon of chylification is produced by the mixture of the chyme with the bile and the pancreatic juice sixteen the bile or gall is a greenish and very bitter liquid secreted by the liver seventeen the liver is a large reddish gland and of a glandular tissue it is lodged in the superior part of the abdomen to the right of the stomach and presents upon its inferior surface a membranous pouch called the gall bladder the bile accumulates in this bladder as in a reservoir and is afterwards poured into the duodenum by a narrow canal called the biliary duct or ductus communis coleductus eighteen the pancreatic juice is a watery liquid which very much resembles saliva it is formed in a gland situate behind the stomach 
which is called the pancreas it reaches the duodenum by a narrow canal which arises in the pancreas and empties near the opening of the biliary duct nineteen the chyme mixed with the bile and pancreatic juice passes through the whole length of the small intestine and during its passage separates into two parts one called chyle which is deposited upon the sides of the intestine to be absorbed the other composed of those parts of the food which are not nutritious which continues its route and enters into the large intestine of the expulsion of the residue left after digestion twenty the alimentary matters which are not convertible into chyle require to be rejected and conveyed out of the body and for this purpose they enter into the large intestine and there accumulate twenty one the large intestine is the second portion of the intestinal tube it differs from the small intestine in its calibre its puffed form and in its uses it is divided into three portions the cecum the colon and the rectum twenty two the cecum is a swelling or dilatation wherein the small intestine terminates we remark there a thin worm-like prolongation which terminates in a cul-de-sac or blind canal and is called the cecal appendix appendicula vermiformis finally we find on its inside a sort of valve which hinders the matters contained in its cavity from returning into the small intestine twenty three the colon is next to the cecum and is continuous with the rectum which terminates at the anal opening or fundament of the absorption of chyle twenty four the chyle is a peculiar liquid resulting from the digestion of food and is deposited upon the parietes of the small intestines twenty five the physical properties of this liquid vary according to the nature of the food from which it is derived and according to the animals in which it is observed in man and most mammalia the chyle is generally a white opaque liquid very much resembling milk of an alkaline saltish taste and of a peculiar odor examined by the microscope it presents a multitude of globules analogous to those which form the central nucleus of the globules of the blood if left at rest it forms a mass like the blood and after some time separates into three parts a solid clot which occupies the bottom of the vessel a liquid resembling serum and a thin pellicle which swims on top and seems to be of a fatty nature twenty six the chyle is destined to be mixed with the blood to repair the losses which this liquid sustains by nourishing the organs and that this mixture may be effected it is pumped up by a particular set of vessels which pour it into the veins twenty seven this passage of the chyle from the intestine into the circulatory system is known under the name of absorption of chyle twenty eight the absorption of chyle is performed by the lymphatic vessels of the intestines which are called for this reason chyliferous vessels or lacteals from the appearance they present when filled with chyle twenty nine these vessels which are extremely delicate arise by imperceptible orifices on the mucous membrane that lines the bowel from different parts of the small intestine by a multitude of branches which little by little unite among themselves as we remarked of the veins and after having traversed the small organs called mesenteric glands empty into a conduit or canal called the thoracic duct thirty this duct or canal which also receives the lymphatic vessels from other parts of the body presents at its inferior extremity a dilatation called the reservoir of pecket or the receptaculum chyli it lies closely glued to the anterior face of the vertebral column or spine and mounts towards the thorax to terminate near the base of the neck in the subclavian vein of the left side thirty one the chyle in passing through the mesenteric glands seem to be perfected in some degree it assumes a rosy tint and becomes coagulable like the blood but it still differs very much from this liquid 
and we do not know with certainty in what part of the body it is changed into blood recapitulation of the functions of nutrition such are the different functions by the aid of which the nutrition of the body is effected thirty two the alimentary substances necessary for renewing the materials of which the organs are composed are derived as we have seen from sources exterior of the animal and in order to serve the purposes of nutrition require to undergo a peculiar preparation to which we give the name of digestion thirty three the chief of the functions of nutrition is consequently in man as in all other animals that of digestion thirty four the nutritious matters thus elaborated do not sojourn in the digestive cavity in order to support the organs they pass from this cavity into the very substance of the body itself to be mixed with the blood to this transportation from without to within and the passage of all substances from without into the torrent of the circulation is applied the term absorption thirty five the blood to convey in this way to all parts of the body materials to repair the organs must necessarily be the seat of continual currents and in fact this liquid finds its way wherever there is life to be supported this phenomenon is called the circulation thirty six in acting upon the tissues of the organs the blood loses a part of its vivifying properties and in order to regain them requires to be brought into contact with the atmospheric air which contact constitutes the phenomenon of respiration thirty seven finally the material separated from the substance of the organs in consequence of the nutritive movement are carried along by the blood and are afterwards separated and rejected from the system in the form of liquids or of vapours these acts which are in a measure the completion of the nutritive process bear the general names of exhalation and secretion thirty eight to recapitulate we see then that the functions of nutrition are constituted of several series of phenomena each having its seat in different organs and that these different acts are first digestion second absorption third circulation fourth simultaneous decomposition and recomposition of the organs of nutrition properly so called fifth respiration sixth exhalation and secretion end of lesson six seven functions of relation nervous system and sensibility functions of relation the phenomena of animal life or life of relation depend upon two faculties that of sensation and that of motion these faculties which do not exist in an equal degree of perfection in all animals are wanting in vegetables they are the result of an action of two apparatuses the apparatus of sensations and the apparatus of motion the apparatus of sensations is composed of the nervous system and the organs of the senses the apparatus of motion is composed of the muscles of the bones and of some other organs apparatus of the sensations sensibility is the faculty of receiving impressions from surrounding objects this faculty has its seat in a particular apparatus called the nervous system it is also through the medium of this nervous system that motion takes place that the influence of the will makes itself felt in different parts of the body and that the phenomena of intelligence is manifested we distinguish in this apparatus two principal parts which are called the nervous system of animal life and the nervous system of organic life the nervous system of animal life presides over the functions of the life of relation it is also called the cerebrospinal system 
because the brain and spinal marrow are the most important parts of it. The term encephalon is applied to the great nervous mass formed by these two organs, and the other central parts of the nervous system lodged in the cavity of the cranium and in the canal which exists in the whole length of the vertebral column. The cranium is a great cavity which occupies all the superior and posterior parts of the head, and which, at the inferior part or base, presents several holes. One of these holes, which is very much larger than the other, and placed a little behind, gives it a communication with the vertebral canal. The vertebral canal is a cavity hollowed out in the vertebral column or spine, of which it occupies the whole length. It consequently descends from the head all along the back to the lowest extremity of the trunk, and even into the tail, when the animal is provided with an appendix of this sort. When we study the skeleton, we shall recur to the description of these parts. The brain, or cerebrum, is a voluminous viscous of a very soft texture and of an oval form which fills the greatest part of the anterior of the cranium. It is divided on a middle line by a very deep furrow into two halves called hemispheres of the brain. Each of these hemispheres is subdivided, in its turn, into three lobes, and presents on its surface a great number of hollows and projections, folded on themselves called the convolutions of the brain. We find in the interior cavities called ventricles, and we distinguish in the substance of which it is composed two sorts of matter one white, called medullary, which occupies the interior of the mass of the brain, and the other, of a grayish color, forms its superficies and is called cortical. Behind and below the cerebrum, or brain, we find, also in the cavity of the cranium, another nervous mass, very much smaller, but of analogous structure, which is called the cerebellum. The spinal marrow arises from the inferior part of the brain and cerebellum. It has the form of a thick whitish cord and descends from the interior of the cranium to the lowest part of the canal which pierces the vertebral column. We give the name of medulla oblongata to the superior portion of the spinal marrow which is enclosed in the cranium. The encephalon, which includes the brain and spinal marrow, also called the cerebrospinal axis, is surrounded by different membranes which serve to prevent it from wounding itself against the sides of the bony case which encloses it. One of these membranes, called the arachnoid, is extremely fine. Another, called the dura mater, is on the contrary very strong, and in the interior of the cranium forms plates or folds which descend between the hemispheres of the cerebrum and between this organ and the cerebellum to sustain these parts and prevent them from pressing one upon the other. A great number of soft whitish cords go from the brain and spinal marrow to all parts of the body. They are designated by the name of nerves. These nerves arise, some from the base of the brain, others from the sides of the spinal marrow. In man there are 43 pairs, of which the first 13 arise from the brain and medulla oblongata, and pass out of the cranium through holes in its base, and the remaining 30 pairs arise from the spinal marrow 
and go out of the vertebral canal by holes situate on each side of the spine. The nerves are divided into branches and ramuscules, which are spread out in the different organs, and in them become so extremely fine as to escape our vision. They possess extreme sensibility, and the slightest wound of one of them causes acute pain. The nerves give to different parts of the body to which they are distributed the sensibility which these parts enjoy. They convey the impressions received by the organs to the brain, which is the seat of the perception of senses. It is also through the medium of the nerves that the influence of the will is communicated from the brain to different parts of the body, and that motion is performed. Indeed, if we cut the nerves which go to a limb, it becomes immediately insensible and ceases to execute voluntary motion, or in other words, it is paralyzed. Certain nerves serve only for the transmission of sensations, others serve only for motion, but the greater part fulfill both these functions at the same time. This arises from the union of a certain number of nervous fibers, of which some possess the first of these faculties, and others the second. At the point where the nerves issue from the spinal marrow, these two species of fibers are still separate, and constitute two distinct roots, one situated before the other. The anterior root serves for motion and the posterior for sensibility. When in a living animal we cut the anterior roots of all these nerves, it is incapable of moving, but preserves its sensibility. While if we cut the posterior roots without wounding the anterior, the contrary is true. The ganglionic nervous system, also called the great sympathetic nerve, or nervous system of organic life, is composed of a number of small, very distinct nervous masses, which are united to each other by medullary cords and different nerves, which anastomose, communicate by branches, with the cerebrospinal system, or are distributed to the neighboring organs. These nervous centers bear the name of ganglions. They are found in the head, neck, thorax, and abdomen. Most of them are placed symmetrically on each side of a middle line, in front of the vertebral column, and thus form a double chain from the head to the pelvis. But they are found in other parts, near the heart, for example, and in the vicinity of the stomach that sensations may be perceived, it is necessary that the nerves transmit them from the point where they are produced to the brain, either directly or through the intervention of the spinal marrow. The brain is, at the same time, the seat of the will and of the perception of sensations. When, in consequence of a wound or strong compression, this organ cannot perform its functions. The animal becomes insensible, ceases to execute voluntary motions, and falls into a state resembling profound sleep. It is remarkable that the nerves which arise from the right side of the spinal marrow communicate with the left hemisphere of the cerebrum, and vice versa. This results from the crossing of the fibers in the medulla oblongata, and hence it is that when the brain is paralyzed on one side only, it is the members of the opposite side of the body which lose their sensibility and motion. Farther, the brain, although the seat of perception of sensations, is itself very slightly sensible. 
we may prick or cut it in a living animal without causing pain. The spinal marrow is, on the contrary, extremely sensible, and when it is wounded, the animal is convulsed. If it can be cut or compressed so that it cannot perform its functions, all the parts of the body whose nerves arise below the point of injury are at once paralyzed. The cerebellum seems to be designed to regulate motion. The second portion of the nervous system, or nervous system of organic life, communicates with the nerves which arise from the spinal marrow by a great number of small filaments, but it is distinct from it. This apparatus, which is also designated under the name of ganglionic system, or great sympathetic, on account of the connection which it establishes between different parts of the body, is composed of a great number of small nervous masses called ganglions, situated in the neck, in the thorax, and in the abdomen in front of the vertebral column, and tied to each other by communicating cords. A multitude of nerves arise from these ganglions and are spread out in the heart, the lungs, the intestines, the glands, and other organs of vegetative life. These parts of the body which receive their nerves from the ganglionic system are slightly sensible, and the movements which they execute are independent of the will. The principal nerves of sensibility terminate in particular organs through the medium of which they receive and transmit to the brain the sensations produced upon us by surrounding objects. These organs are each destined to receive sensations of a certain kind and are called organs of the senses. End of Lesson 7 Lesson 8. Functions of Relation. Sense of Touch. Skin, Hands, Hair, Beard, Nails, Horns. Mode of Formation. Sense of Smell. Olfactory Apparatus. Sense of Taste. Sense of Hearing. Auditory Apparatus. We give the name of senses to those faculties by the aid of which animals take cognizance of the properties of bodies which surround them. Bodies may differ from each other in different ways, in their weight, their hardness, their volume, their temperature, etc., by their odor, their taste, their form and their color, or by the sounds which they afford. These various qualities cannot be appreciated by the same organ. The organ which perceives taste, for example, is not sensible of the color or odor of bodies. Therefore, the faculty of experiencing sensations from the influence derived from each other of these different kinds of the properties of external objects is the attribute of a particular organ. These faculties or senses in men and most animals are five in number, namely touch, taste, smell, hearing, and sight. Touch and taste are only exercised upon bodies which are brought into contact with those organs which are the seat of those senses. Smell, hearing, and sight make us acquainted with certain properties of objects at a greater or less distance from us. All animals do not possess the senses in an equal number with man. In some, there is neither organ of sight, nor organ of hearing, nor organ of smell, such is the oyster, for example. In others, one or another of these instruments is wanting. We will now consider each one of the senses and the organs which are the seat of them. On the sense of touch. Touch is the sense which reveals to us the contact of foreign bodies with our organs and informs us of the nature of their surfaces, whether rough or smooth, their movements, the degree of their consistence, their temperature and, to a certain extent, 
their form, volume, and weight. Tact is a passive touch, but this function sometimes becomes active. It is more especially called touch when the sensibility is most exquisite and the surface, which is its seat, can in a manner mould itself to objects. Tactile sensibility is spread out in all parts of the surface of the body and resides in the skin. The skin is the membrane which covers or clothes the body. It is principally composed of two parts, one called the corium or derma or true skin, the other the epidermis or cuticle or scarf skin. The epidermis is the most superficial layer of the skin. It is a sort of thick varnish which covers the derma and serves to protect it against the contact of hard bodies and prevent it from becoming dry by the action of the air. The derma is the thickest and most important part of the skin. It is beneath the epidermis and adheres to the subjacent parts by its internal face. A considerable number of nerves are distributed in it and form upon its surface small elevations called papillae. To these nerves the skin owes its sensibility, which is greatest in those parts where there is the greatest number of papillae, as in the ends of the fingers, for example. The epidermis is applied upon these nervous papillae. It is not itself endowed with sensibility and renders the sense of touch less delicate in proportion to its thickness. Frequent contact with rough and hard substances tends to increase its thickness, Thus, the hands of those persons who perform laborious work have the epidermis thicker and less sensible than those whose occupation does not place them in the same circumstances. Hair, beard, nails, horns, etc. are productions formed by small secreting organs lodged in the substance of the skin. They are developed, like the teeth, by the addition of new portions of their substance upon that already formed, and are not like living organs, the seat of a nutritive movement. We give the name of bulb to the secreting organs of the hair and beard. Finally, there exists in the thickness of the derma little follicles, which secrete the sweat, a liquid which is more or less acid. The contact of an object with any point of the surface of the skin is sufficient to determine a sensation there, but, that touch may be exercised, it is necessary that the part where this contact takes place shall be so formed as to apply itself exactly, and, in a manner, mould itself to the object which the animal wishes to feel. This kind of perfected tact has its seat in particular organs called organs of touch. In man, the hand is the special organ of touch, and its structure is admirably well adapted to the exercise of this sense. The fineness of the skin, its great sensibility, the species of cushion formed by the subcutaneous fat at the extremities of the fingers, the length and flexibility of these organs, and the capability of opposing the thumb to the other fingers, like a pair of pliers or forceps, are so many conditions essentially favourable to the delicacy of this sense, and enables us to appreciate with great exactitude the qualities of those bodies we may feel. Most animals have very imperfect instruments of touch, and, in general, the greater part of the surface of their bodies is slightly or not at all sensible, on account of the hairs, feathers, scales, and other hard parts with which their skins are covered. Of the sense of taste. Taste is a sense which makes us acquainted with the savour or taste of substances. Like touch, taste is exercised by contact only. Its seat is in the mouth. The parts of the mouth where this peculiar kind of sensibility resides are the edges of the tongue and the arch of the palate. All substances are not sapid. Those which are not soluble in water seldom are. In order to act upon the sense of taste, it is necessary that the sapid substances which the animal introduces into its mouth 
should be dissolved by the fluids poured into this cavity by the salivary glands or by some other liquid it is in a state of solution that savors are perceived by the nerves of taste which are spread out upon the surface of the tongue and which transmit to the brain the impressions of this sense of the sense of smell the sense of smell reveals to us the existence of odors and enables us to appreciate them odors are produced by extremely fine particles which escape from odorous substances and which are diffused in the air like a vapor that odors may act upon the sense of smell the odoriferous particles must come in contact with the surface of the organ wherein this sense is seated the sense of smell is exercised in a peculiar apparatus called the nasal fossae the nasal fossae figure 27 are two large cavities in the face which communicate externally by the openings of the nose or nostrils and open behind into the pharynx by the posterior nares or nostrils the walls of these cavities form in front a more or less prominent ridge which constitutes the nose and a vertical partition separates one from the other finally they are lined by a soft and very delicate membrane called the pituitary membrane the first pair of cerebral nerves which are called the olfactory nerves are distributed to this membrane and transmit to the brain the impressions produced by the contact of odoriferous particles the air which traverses the nasal fossae in order to reach the lungs carries with it the odorous particles of substances and it is by touching the pituitary membrane that these particles produce the sensations of smells the form of the nasal fossae is such that the air is carried towards their superior parts where the greatest number of the delicate filaments of the olfactory nerve is distributed it is vulgarly believed that the humors with which the pituitary membrane is lubricated come from the brain but this is an error they are secreted by this membrane itself and the slight diseases known under the name of cold in the head room of the head are nothing else than inflammation of this membrane of the sense of hearing hearing is the sense which enables us to perceive sounds sounds are produced by very rapid oscillatory movements which are manifested in sonorous bodies and which are called vibrations sonorous vibrations are communicated from the bodies in which they are produced to the surrounding air and are thus propagated little by little or nearer and nearer like the undulation produced on the surface of smooth water by casting a stone into it that sounds may act upon our senses the oscillatory motion must reach the bottom of the apparatus of hearing that it may agitate the extremity of the nerve destined to transmit the sensation which it produces the apparatus of hearing is called the ear it is double and is symmetrically placed on each side of the head each of these apparatuses is lodged in the interior of one of the bones of the cranium called the temporal bone that part of the temporal bone which contains it is extremely hard and for this reason has received the name of petrous bone the apparatus of hearing is very complicated in its structure it may be divided into three principal parts which anatomists have called the external ear the middle ear or cavity of the tympanum and the internal ear or labyrinth figure 28 the external ear is composed of the pavilion of the ear and the auditory canal meatus auditorius externus the external ear or pavilion of the ear figure 28 p is a very elastic cartilaginous plate which surrounds the entrance to the auditory apparatus and presents in many animals the form of a trumpet which serves to direct sounds towards the interior of the ear in man the pavilion of the ear presents many ridges and furrows or anfractuosities 
arising from the folds of the cartilaginous plate which forms it. The auricular canal, or external auditory canal, meatus auditorius externus, figure 28, C, A, is a species of tube which commences at the bottom of a widened part of the pavilion, called concha, and buries itself in the temporal bone. It is gaping at its external extremity, but ends internally in a species of membranous partition, named membrana tympani, drum of the ear, which separates it from the middle ear. The middle ear is composed of the cavity of the tympanum and some small accessory parts. The name of tympanum, figure 28, CAI, is given to a small cavity of irregular form which is hollowed out in the petrous portion of the temporal bone and which is found to lie between the auditory canal and the internal ear. It is filled with air, which gets there through a canal called the Eustachian tube, which opens in the superior part of the pharynx. The entrance to the tympanum is closed by a very thin partition, which is stretched like a parchment over a drum, and hence the name tympanum. This membrane serves to facilitate the transmission of sounds from without to the very bottom of the auditory apparatus, and also to moderate the intensity of sounds, for it is so arranged that it can be stretched or relaxed, and when stretched, it transmits sounds less perfectly. We also remark in the interior of the tympanum a transverse chain formed of four small bones named on account of their shape, the malleus, hammer, incus, anvil, lenticular bone or os orbiculare, and stapes, stirrup. The malleus rests upon the membrane of the tympanum and affords attachment to muscles which, by contracting, may cause it to press more or less strongly upon the membrane. In this way it is stretched or relaxed to adapt itself to the intensity of the sounds by which it is struck. In the interior of the cavity of the tympanum there are two small openings which are closed up by membranes stretched over them like that of the tympanum. They lead to the internal ear. One of them, called the fenestra ovalis or foramen ovale, is in contact with the base of the stapes. The other, called the fenestra rotunda or foramen rotundum, is situated a little lower down. The cavity of the tympanum also communicates with a great number of cells which are in the substance of the petrous bone. The internal ear is composed of three parts namely the vestibule, the semicircular canals, and the cochlea, figure 28. These organs are filled with a watery liquid in which the filaments of the acoustic nerve terminate. The vestibule and the acoustic nerves constitute the essential part of the auditory apparatus. The other parts, which we have just enumerated, are destined to perfect this apparatus and for the most part may be destroyed even in man, without deafness being the necessary consequence of their loss. They are absent in a great many animals. For example, birds have not the pavilion of the ear, reptiles are destitute of the pavilion and the auditory canal. In fish all parts of the middle ear or tympanum are wanting, and in other animals, such as the crawfish, the apparatus of hearing consists only of a small vesicle similar to the vestibule. End of lesson 8. Lesson 9. Sight. Functions of relation. Sense of sight. Light. Apparatus of vision. Eyebrows. Eyelids. Lacrimal apparatus. Muscles of the eye. Structure of the eye. Use of different parts of the eye. Voice. Of the sight. Sight is the sense by which we perceive the form, color, volume and position of objects that surround us. This sense, which Buffon called 
distant touch is exercised at a distance through the medium of light to comprehend the mechanism of sight it is not sufficient to know the structure of the eye we must also be familiar with some of the properties of light the study of which subject belongs to that branch of science called optics light is a fluid which fills space and illuminates the earth it emanates from luminous bodies such as the sun the fixed stars and substances in combustion and diffuses itself afar with inconceivable rapidity in proportion as the rays become distant from the body from which they emanate they diverge one from the other and for this reason bodies are better lighted the nearer they are to the illuminating body when light meets with a body it either passes through it or is reflected from it or it may be absorbed those bodies which permit light to pass through them are called transparent those which oppose its passage are called opaque in order to see an object the rays of light which emanate from it or which are reflected by it must reach to the bottom of the eye for this reason an opaque body placed between the eye and the object at which we look renders the latter invisible the surfaces of opaque bodies do not always reflect back the light the same as they receive it as we have said there are some which absorb all the rays such bodies are called black bodies that reflect all the rays or nearly all are white but those which decompose them are colored color is not inherent in bodies it depends upon the manner in which they decompose the light and the kind of luminous ray that the colored body can reflect each ordinary ray of light though it appears colorless to us is composed of seven differently colored rays there is a very simple mode of being convinced of this fact if we receive a bundle of luminous rays which have passed through a glass prison upon a sheet of paper instead of producing a white image it will form an oblong image in which we distinguish the following seven colors namely red orange yellow green blue indigo violet now objects appear to us white when they reflect the light without decomposing it and colored in this or that manner when they decompose it like the prism and absorb some rays and reflect others in passing through transparent bodies rays of light sometimes continue to follow their primitive direction but on other occasions they change their direction and approach towards or diverge from each other for example when a straight stick is plunged half of its length obliquely into water it seems as if it were broken and it is by acting in this way upon light that the concave or convex glasses of spectacles enlarge or diminish the images of bodies this deviation of light is called refraction in order to see a body the rays of light which part from it must reach the bottom of the eye and there paint an image of the object the impression thus produced is perceived by a particular nerve and by it transmitted to the brain which receives the sensation the apparatus of sight is composed first of the organ of vision which consists of the globe of the eye and its nerve second of the accessory organs of vision that is of the protectors and movers of the eye one the globe of the eye figure thirty one is a hollow ball filled with certain humors and so arranged that the rays of light may penetrate it and collect upon the nerve which occupies its bottom the sides of this globe are composed of a very solid membrane which consists of two parts one situated in front and named transparent cornea the other occupying the sides and bottom and called sclerotica figure thirty one the sclerotica surrounds the eye in all parts except in front it is white and entirely opaque it is this part which is vulgarly called the white of the eye 
the transparent cornea is on the contrary diaphanous it is framed into a great hole in the sclerotica and resembles a somewhat arched watch glass set into a hollow white ball a short distance behind the transparent cornea is found a sort of vertical partition named iris from its varied colors which are seen through the cornea its centre is pierced by an opening which is susceptible of enlargement and diminution it is called the pupil the space comprised between the cornea and the iris is called the anterior chamber of the eye which is filled with a transparent liquid called the aqueous humor behind the pupil we find the crystalline lens which is a transparent lens of a globular form and behind the crystalline we find a diaphantous mass soft as jelly which is called vitreous humor and which fills all the interior of the globe of the eye the optic nerve which comes from the brain enters the globe of the eye through the posterior part of the sclerotica and then expands itself out into a soft whitish membrane called retina which envelopes the hinder part of the vitreous humor between the retina and the internal face of the sclerotica we find another membrane generally colored black called the choroid tunica choroides it is this coat which is seen through the retina and the humors of the eye when we look towards the bottom of the organ and which gives to the pupil the appearance of being a black spot inside of a hole such are the different parts which compose the globe of the eye let us pass to the consideration of vision the rays of light which leave an object at which we look penetrate to the retina and there form a small but very clear image of that object the manner in which the light acts in the interior of the eye is the same as in the optical instrument called a camera obscura the different transparent parts through which the luminous rays pass to get from the cornea to the retina have the effect of collecting the rays and concentrating them upon the retina it is the crystalline lens especially that determines this concentration of light and upon this phenomenon depends the formation of images at the bottom of the eye when the eye concentrates the light with too much force we cannot see distinctly except at a very short distance to this infirmity is applied the term myopia or short-sightedness when on the contrary the luminous rays are not sufficiently concentrated in their passage through the eye only distant objects are distinctly seen and this defect is called presbyopia or long-sightedness this feebleness in the refracting power of the eye is a consequence of old age and is remedied by wearing convex glasses before the eyes to give short-sighted people a longer vision we must on the contrary employ spectacles with concave glasses which scatter the luminous rays and thus counterbalance the too strong refracting force of the eye the iris is contractile and its principal use is to regulate the quantity of light which should penetrate to the bottom of the eye when the light is too vivid it contracts and consequently diminishes the pupil through which the rays must pass to reach the retina in the dark on the contrary the pupil is enlarged the choroid membrane which lines the internal face of the globe of the eye is covered with a sort of black varnish which absorbs all the luminous rays not necessary for vision images painted if we may use this term upon the retina are transmitted to the brain through the medium of the optic nerve the accessory parts of the apparatus of vision are of two kinds the one is designated to protect the globe or ball of the eye the other to move it and give the required direction to fulfil its functions in the best manner the protecting organs of the eye are first the orbit second the eyelids third the lacrimal apparatus fourth the eyebrows the orbit is a great bony cavity hollowed out in the face on each side of the nose it has the form of a cone the base of which is open and directed forward its parietes are formed 
above by the frontal bone, below by the superior maxillary bone, externally or outwardly by the malar or cheekbone, and internally by the bones which belong partly to the nose. The bottom of the orbit is pierced by a large hole, which communicates with the cranium and gives passage to the optic nerve. The ball of the eye is set into this cavity and rests upon a sort of cushion formed of fat. It is protected in the same way on all sides except in front, and there we find the eyelids. The eyelids are movable curtains stretched in front of the ball of the eye. On the outside they are formed of the skin, internally they are lined by a smooth membrane which is reflected over the front of the eye upon the sclerotica, and this membrane is called the membrana conjunctiva. Between these two membranes, the conjunctiva and the skin, there is placed a thin plate of fibrous and resisting substance called tarsus or palpebral cartilage, as well as muscles which serve to move these organs. In men there are two eyelids, one superior and the other inferior. The superior eyelid is larger than the inferior. Each eyelid has two edges or borders, one is continuous with the skin, the other is free. The free border of the eyelids is bristled with delicate hairs called cilia or eyelashes. The use of the cilia is to form a kind of little grating in front of the eye to arrest foreign bodies, the presence of which would interfere with the exercise of vision. The eyelids perform the double office of protecting the ball of the eye by closing in front of it and of rendering it inaccessible to luminous rays, the brilliancy of which might disturb sleep. Besides, the eyelids by their alternate movement of depression and elevation spread over the front of the globe of the eye, the tears, an aqueous liquid, which prevents the cornea from drying, and also favours the motion of the eyelids. The lacrimal apparatus, which secretes the tears, is composed of several organs, some of which are destined to form this liquid and pour it over the front of the eye, and as the presence of the tears, if too long continued, would become troublesome, other organs convey them from the eye. The first organs are first, the lacrimal gland, a small body the size of an almond, placed at the exterior and superior part of the globe of the eye, between it and the orbitary cavity. Figure 32. It serves to secrete the tears. Second, several small canals which arise in this gland and open upon the internal face of the adhering border of the upper eyelid, where they constantly pour upon the conjunctiva the lacrimal fluid or tears. The organs destined to carry away those tears which have been spread over the front of the eye and to convey them into the nasal fossae or nostrils are two little canals which open upon the free border of the eyelids near the internal angle of the eye by two small orifices called the lacrimal points, puncta lacrimalia, figure 32. Each of these points, which are placed one above and the other below, communicate with a little curved canal which runs inwards and opens into a vertical conduit that is larger in size, called the nasal canal, and which empties into the nasal fossae. The function of these lacrimal puncta is to pump up and receive the tears as fast as they are poured over the eye. In this way the fluid is carried off as fast as it is formed. Under particular circumstances the equilibrium between these two phenomena is destroyed, and either that the tears are secreted in too large a quantity, or the lacrimal puncta do not pump them off with proportioned activity, or they are obstructed in the passage through the lacrimal ducts and nasal canal, this fluid overruns the eyelids and falls in considerable quantity along the cheeks. The eyebrows, which form a ridge above the orbit and are garnished with hairs, also belong to the protecting organs of the eye, but their use is less important than that of those organs of which we have just spoken. They assist in shading the eyes when exposed to strong light. 
the motor organs of the eye consist of six muscles which are fixed by their anterior extremities into the sclerotica and by their posterior extremities to the bottom of the orbit figure thirty three by contracting they direct the ocular globe to the side where their muscular fibres are placed the apparatus of vision presents nearly the same structure in the mammalia birds reptiles and fishes but in insects the organization of the eyes is very different as we shall see when we come to the history of these animals through the medium of the senses we take cognizance of all that surrounds us but our relations with the external world would be very imperfect if we could not act upon these bodies exchange place and express what we feel indeed we do possess this power which is the result of the faculty of producing sounds and of the faculty of executing motion of the voice voice consists in the production of a particular sound by the aid of the air which escapes from the lungs a great number of organs take part in the performance of this function but that one which is especially its seat is the larynx a sort of cartilaginous tube which at its superior extremity opens into the pharynx by an opening named glottis and which by its inferior opening communicates with the windpipe which is in a manner only a prolongation of it figures thirty four and thirty five the larynx is essentially the organ which produces the voice and it is the passage of air through its interior which occasions the sounds there formed to deprive an animal of this faculty it is only necessary to open the windpipe for then the air finding an exit through the accidental opening no longer passes through the larynx nor is it subjected to the vibrations which would have been imparted by this organ the larynx which is composed of several cartilaginous plates forming in front what is vulgarly called adam's apple is lined by a mucous membrane which forms near its middle two broad lateral folds directed from the front backwards and arranged very much like the edges of a buttonhole these folds are called the vocal cords or inferior ligaments of the glottis by the aid of a little muscle situate in their folds the slit or opening of the glottis which is between them can be narrowed or enlarged under ordinary circumstances the air expelled from the lungs passes freely through the larynx and produces no sound but when the opening of the glottis is narrowed by the contraction of the muscles of this organ and the passage of the air becomes more rapid the voice is heard words are produced by the modifications which the column of air receives in the interior of the mouth by the combined action of the palate the cheeks the tongue and lips end of lesson nine lesson ten motion the organs of motion are divided into two classes first those which act and produce the motive force second those to which the action is communicated or in other words they are divided into the active and passive organs of locomotion. The first are the muscles, the second are the bones or those parts which hold their place. Of the osseous system. Man and all the other mammalia, as well as birds, reptiles, and fishes, have in their structure solid parts which are called bones, and the union of these bones, one with the other, constitutes the skeleton. The skeleton is a kind of frame which gives firmness to the body in a considerable degree, determines its dimensions and its form, serves to protect the organs which are most important to life and furnishes the passive instruments of motion to the function of locomotion of the composition of bones the bones are formed of a species of cartilage composed of gelatin the substance which constitutes strong glue all the laminae and all the fibres of which are encrusted with a strong matter composed of lime united to particular acids phosphoric acid etc when bone is burned the stony matter remains alone and is reduced to powder by slight friction, and when bone is steeped in a particular liquid, which has the property of dissolving the stony matter, hydrochloric acid, it is reduced to the state of a flexible cartilage. In infancy, bone is at first cartilaginous, and before ossification is complete, each one is formed of several distinct pieces, 
which run together, as it were, at a later period. The bones that constitute the skeleton are united one to the other by articulations or joints, which change their name according to their form. If the articulation that unites two bones permits them to move one on the other, it is called a movable articulation. If, on the contrary, the articulation is merely to secure the solidity and firmness of the bones, it is called immovable. The more movable an articulation, the less solid it is, and vice versa. The more solid, the less mobility it possesses. The immovable articulations take place through the medium of asperities which dovetail together. This mode of union is called a suture. The articular surface of the movable bones is covered with an elastic substance which is capable of bearing the strongest pressure and which deadens the shocks they receive. This substance is called cartilage. The articulations are also supplied with a viscous fluid called synovia, designed to favor the sliding of the articular surfaces upon each other. The extremities of the bones that concur to form an articulation correspond by having their respective configurations reciprocal. They are, in general, one convex, the other concave. The means of union between bones is by fibrous parts which bear the name of ligaments. These are very strong bands or species of cords which surround the articulation or joint, holding together the two bones by their extremities. The articulations present a great variety in the motions of which they are susceptible. The bones are also very different in their forms, and on account of this circumstance, they are divided into long, short, and flat bones. The long bones are generally cylindrical, of considerable size, and in the interior hollowed into a canal filled with a fatty matter called marrow. This form, without injuring their solidity, diminishes their weight. At their extremities, these bones are enlarged to afford a broader surface for the articulation. It is easy to perceive that, if the bones were in contact by small surfaces, their union would have been less solid, they would have afforded only an uncertain and insecure motion, and their derangement would have been as common as it is now rare. About their middle, the long bones are formed almost entirely of very compact substance, but at their swollen extremities, they are chiefly composed of a spongy substance which is not so heavy. It is these bones that form the solid framework of the limbs. Neither the short nor the flat bones have any cavity in the interior. The short bones are formed almost entirely of spongy substance, which lessens their weight without diminishing their volume. The chief use of the flat bones is to form the parietes of cavities which afford protection to internal organs. They are not, however, insusceptible of motion. They furnish points of attachment to many muscles. We remark inequalities upon the surfaces of bones which afford points of attachment for muscles. They often present for the same purpose, as well as for the ligaments of the joints, salient prolongations, which are named apophyses or processes. Of the skeleton. The skeleton is a species of frame formed by the union of the different bones of the body. A great many animals are without it, but it exists in the mammalia, birds, reptiles, and fishes. To study it, we will select the skeleton of man. The skeleton, like the body, is divided into head, trunk, and extremities. The head is placed at the superior extremity of the body and is divided into two parts, the cranium and face. The face presents five great cavities destined to lodge the organs of sight, of smell, and of taste. These cavities are the two orbits for the eyes, the two nasal fossae, and the mouth. A great number of bones concur to form the face. The principal ones are, first, the two superior maxillary bones, which constitute nearly the whole of the upper jaw and rise at the sides of the nose to join the frontal bone. Second, the malar, or cheek bones, which form the cheeks in part and extend from the superior maxillary to the frontal bone so as to complete the orbit on the outside. Third, the inferior maxillary bone, which constitutes the lower jaw, presents nearly the form of a horseshoe. There are also other bones in the face, called palate, nasal, unguiform or lacrimal, spongy bones, and vomer. The cranium is a bony cavity of an oval form, serving to contain the brain. It is formed by the union of several flat bones which are in front the frontal, upon the sides and above the parietal, behind the occipital, below and on the sides the temporal, and in the middle the sphenoid, and inferiorly and in front the ethmoid, which also serves to complete the orbits and form the superior part of the nasal fossae. On the sides of the cranium, we remark an opening for the auditory canal, 
and on its inferior face or base we find many holes which serve to give passage to nerves and blood vessels. One of these holes, very much larger than the others, called the occipital hole, foramen occipitale, corresponds with the vertebral canal and gives passage to the spinal marrow, and on each side of this great hole we find an eminence called condyle, which serves for the articulation of the head upon the vertebral column. The trunk is composed of the vertebral column, the ribs, and sternum. The vertebral column, or spine, is a species of bony stalk or stem which occupies the middle line of the back and extends from the head to the posterior extremity of the body. It is formed by the union of small, short bones called vertebrae and presents throughout its whole length a canal formed by the union of the holes by which each vertebra is pierced. This canal serves to lodge the spinal marrow. Each of these bones presents in front of the hole a species of thick, solid disc called the body of the vertebra, which is very firmly united to the body of the vertebra next to it. Behind, we remark prolongations called transverse and spinous processes, which form what is commonly called the spine. The vertebral column is divided into five categories, namely, first, the cervical region, which constitutes the frame of the neck. In man and all the other mammalia, it is composed of seven vertebrae. Second, the dorsal or thoracic region, which gives attachment to the ribs which form the chest or thorax. The vertebrae of this region in man are 12 in number. Third, the lumbar region, which terminates the back below, in man is composed of five vertebrae. Fourth, the sacral region, which articulates with the bones of the hips, is composed in man of five vertebrae, so run or fused together as to form but a single bone called the sacrum. Fifth, the caudal or custodian region, which in man is composed of four very small vertebrae concealed beneath the skin, in many animals is very long, constituting the tail. The vertebral column seen in profile presents four curves which correspond to the neck, the back, the loins, and the pelvis or basin, and which serve to augment its solidity. On its sides we find, between all the vertebrae, a hole which gives passage to a nerve coming from the spinal marrow. The ribs, which are attached to the dorsal vertebrae, are long, flat bones which enclose the thorax on each side. They are curved and bear considerable resemblance to a half hoop. In man, there are twelve pairs. The seven first, called true ribs, articulate in front with the sternum through the medium of a cartilage. The five last pairs, called false ribs, terminate anteriorly by a cartilage which joins that of the preceding rib, or they are entirely without cartilage. The sternum is a flat bone placed in front of the thorax. It articulates with the ribs and with the clavicles. The superior or anterior extremities are composed of the shoulder, the arm, the forearm, and the hand. The shoulder is the basis of the whole limb attached to it. It consists of two bones, the scapula or shoulder blade and the clavicle or collarbone. The scapula is a large bone nearly triangular in shape which is applied against the ribs at the superior and lateral part of the back. At its superior external angle, it presents an enlarged articular surface, slightly hollowed, which receives the bone of the arm and is called the glenoid cavity of the scapula. On the posterior face of this bone, there is a projecting comb or ridge which extends over the articulation of the shoulder and articulates with the clavicle. This prolongation is named the acromion. The clavicle is a long, thin bone situated at the base of the neck. It extends like a buttress between the scapula and sternum and serves to keep the first of these bones in its natural position and to prevent the shoulder from falling too far forward. The arm is formed of a single bone called the humerus. This bone is of a cylindrical form and has a swelling at its superior extremity called the head of the humerus, which articulates with the glenoid cavity of the scapula. Its inferior extremity is enlarged transversely and resembles a pulley upon which moves the forearm. The forearm is formed by the union of two bones which are, on the inner side, the cubitus or ulna, and on the outside, the side on which the thumb is placed, the radius. These bones are joined to the humerus by their superior extremities and to the hand by their inferior extremities. The hand in man is divided into three regions, the carpus, the metacarpus, and fingers. The carpus, or wrist, is composed of eight small bones ranged in two rows and united to each other by fibrous threads which preserve their mutual relations and permit them to move a little upon each other by aid of the smooth surfaces by which they are in contact. The metacarpus is composed of five bones which may be regarded as the origin of the fingers. 
They are placed parallel, one alongside of the other. Their superior extremities articulate with the bones of the carpus, and their inferior extremities with the fingers. The fingers are composed of small bones articulated one at the extremity of the other and called phalanges. Except the thumb, which has but two, each finger has three of these bones. The inferior extremities are formed nearly in the same manner as the superior. The hip represents the shoulder, the thigh the arm, the leg the forearm, and the foot the hand. The hip or haunch serves to support the abdominal member or lower extremity as the shoulder sustains the thoracic member. It is formed on each side by a very large and very strong bone, the ilium. These bones are united together in front, and behind they articulate with the sacrum, so as to form in conjunction with it at the bottom of the belly a sort of bony belt called the pelvis or basin. In infancy we find that the ilium bone consists of three separate portions, one of which resembles the scapula somewhat and is called the ilium. The second, placed in front, called the pubis, may, perhaps, compare with the clavicle. And the third, situated below and behind, has received the name of ischium, and which supports the whole weight of the body when seated. With age, these three bones become solidified into one. At the point where they unite, we find a very deep circular cavity called the cotyloid, or more commonly the acetabulum, in which is articulated the thigh bone. The pelvis serves not only to support the lower extremities, but also assists in sustaining the weight of the viscera contained in the abdomen and in forming the parietes of this cavity. The thigh is formed of a single bone called the femur. This bone is articulated by its superior extremity with the hip bone and by its inferior extremity with the leg. The leg is formed of two bones very solidly united to each other. The bone placed internally, very much larger than the other and called tibia, articulates with the femur by its superior extremity. The bone which is placed externally does not quite reach to the femur and is only united to the tibia. It is named fibula. In front of the articulation of the leg with the thigh is placed a small bone named rotula or patella, which is designed to strengthen the knee joint. The foot is divided into three regions, the tarsus, the metatarsus, and toes. It differs from the hand chiefly in the shortness of the fingers, that is, toes, their limited mobility, and by the disposition of the tarsus. The tarsus is constituted of the union of seven bones, one of which alone, called the astragalus, articulates with the two bones of the leg. Another one of these bones, called the calcis, forms a considerable projection which constitutes the heel. The metatarsus is composed of five bones which are united to the tarsus and to the bones of the toes, and which are arranged like the bones of the metacarpus. Like the fingers, the toes are composed of phalanges called first, second, and third phalanges. The great toe has but two phalanges, each of the others has three. All these little bones are joined to each other by articular surfaces, the contact and junction of which are secured by fibrous ligaments. Of the muscles. All the great motions of the body are caused by the displacement or movement of some of the bones which form the skeleton, but these bones cannot move of themselves and only change their position through the action of other organs attached to them which, by contracting, draw the bones after them. These motor organs are the muscles. They are very numerous and constitute what is commonly called flesh and form nearly one half of the total mass of the body. They are a species of ribbon or fleshy cords composed of fasciculi or bundles of fibers united together and which have the property of contraction or elongation. All the muscles destined to produce the great movements of the body are fixed to the skeleton by their two extremities. It therefore follows that when they contract, they displace those bones which offer the least resistance and draw them towards those which are not movable but serve as points of support for moving the first. Now, in most instances, the bones are more movable in proportion as they are more distant from the center of the body, and the muscles which are fixed between two bones generally act upon that which is most distant, and we always find the muscles destined to move a bone extend from it towards the trunk. For example, the muscles which move the fingers occupy the palm of the hand and the forearm, those which flex the forearm upon the arm occupy the arm, and those which move the arm on the shoulder are placed upon the shoulder. Under ordinary circumstances, however, the muscles displace the bones which serve them as points of support. When the body is suspended by the hands and we endeavor to raise it, the flexor muscles of the forearm, not being able to displace the latter, approximate the arm and thus draw the whole body after it. 
When a muscle contracts, it swells. Its fibers, which in a state of repose were straight, fold and zigzag, and their two extremities are brought near to each other, drawing also with them the parts to which they are attached, but their volume is not augmented. The two extremities of muscle are solidly fixed to the bones and to the other parts which they are designed to set in motion, such as skin, through the medium of white cords called tendons, or membranes of the same nature called aponeuroses or fascia. In contracting, they must necessarily draw towards each other the two bones to which the tendons or aponeuroses are attached. An example will enable us better to understand this mechanism. If we suppose the muscle to be attached to the humerus and to the ulna or cubitus, which articulates with the first, forming the elbow joint by movable ligaments, it is evident that when this muscle contracts, these bones will approach each other. This example will give an idea of all the motions of the skeleton. The number of muscles of the human body is very considerable. They are reckoned at 470. In general, they form about the skeleton two layers and are distinguished into superficial and deep-seated. The muscles which are designed to move any particular bone are almost always placed around that portion of the skeleton which is situated between the bone to be moved and the center of the body. For example, the muscles which move the head are situated on the neck, those which move the arm are on the shoulder, those which flex and extend the forearm surround the humerus, and those which flex and extend the fingers are placed upon the forearm. The same is true of the muscles of the lower extremities. The muscles are divided into flexors, extensors, rotators, elevators, etc., according to the uses which they subserve. The contraction of the muscles is determined by the action of the nervous system, and each muscle receives a nerve which is ramified in its substance. This contraction is sometimes affected through the influence of the will, and sometimes independently of it. The muscles whose action is dependent upon the will belong to the functions of relation, and those whose motions are involuntary, the heart, for example, belong to the functions of vegetative life. The strength or power of a muscle depends partly upon its volume and partly on the manner of its attachment to the bone which it moves. All things being in other respects equal, the strongest muscles are the largest, and from exercise both their volume and strength are at the same time increased. In the bodies of animals, the muscles and the bones are generally placed unfavorably for the power of motion, but very favorably for rapidity, as may be easily demonstrated by the elementary principles of mechanism. The muscles not only serve to enable us to execute different motions, but they are also equally necessary to maintain the movable bones in the positions proper to them, and their action determines the attitudes. For example, the head by its own weight has a tendency to fall forward, but the contraction of the muscles on the back of the neck keep it erect. Of the attitudes. The term attitude is applied to any position of the body that is permanent during any considerable time. In order to explain the mechanism of the attitudes, it will be necessary to enter into some of the details which properly belong to the study of physics. All bodies, when left to themselves, tend towards each other from the influence of a general force called attraction, and the force with which one body attracts another is great in proportion as its mass is larger comparatively than that of the attracted body. Now, the mass of the earth being incomparably larger than that of the animals, plants, stones, and all other objects spread upon its surface, attracts them unceasingly and tends to cause them to fall towards the center of the globe. In order that a body shall rest in the position it occupies, it must be sustained by something capable of resisting this force of attraction and which does not give way under its weight, such as the solid surface of the earth itself or an inflexible body placed between it and this surface. We name base of support the space occupied by the points by which an object supports itself upon a resistant body or the space comprised between these points. In order that a solid body shall rest motionless or immovable upon its base of support and not fall, it is not necessary that all its points should be thus sustained. It is enough to sustain it by a single point, provided this point be placed in such a manner that if a part of the mass fall towards the earth, another part opposite to it, and of equal weight, be elevated as much, the weight of one part counterbalancing the other. 
Center of gravity is the name given to the point about which all points of a body reciprocally balance each other, and if it be sustained, it is sufficient to maintain the entire mass in place. It follows, then, that to prevent a body from falling, it is sufficient that its base be placed vertically beneath its center of gravity. It is also easy to understand that its equilibrium will be more stable in proportion to the extent of its base, for then its center of gravity may be more displaced without the vertical line which passes through the center of gravity being carried beyond the limits of this base of support. The more the center of gravity is elevated above the base of support, the less firm, on the contrary, will be the equilibrium, for a smaller displacement from this point will then suffice to carry the vertical line that descends from it beyond the base of support, which soon causes the body to fall. The term attitude is applied to any position of the body that is permanent during any considerable time. The principal attitudes of man are lying, sitting, and the erect position on his feet, or standing. When a man is lying on his back or on his belly, all parts of the body rest upon the earth. He is not then required to contract any muscle to keep them in place, and his position unites in the highest degree the two conditions of equilibrium to wit, the greatest possible extent of the base of support, and the proximity of the center of gravity to this base. Hence, the attitude of repose is that from which it is most difficult to fall. In the sitting position, the body rests upon the tuberosities of the ischium or haunch bones. The base of support is considerable, since it is represented by the pelvis, the extent of which is increased by the soft parts which cover it. This position also, next to lying, offers the greatest solidity, but it cannot be preserved without muscular action. When the back is supported, the muscles of the neck alone contract to preserve the head erect. But if the back is not supported, as when seated on a stool or a bench, for example, then the greater part of muscles on the back of the trunk contract to prevent it from falling forward, and fatigue will sooner or later result from this permanent action. When man is erect, the lower extremities sustain the body and transmit to the earth the weight which they support. Consequently, these limbs must not bend under the load and must be kept straight by the contraction of their extensor muscles. In this position, the center of gravity of the whole body lies in the cavity of the pelvis, and the base of support is circumscribed by the space comprised between the two feet. Here, a slight force is sufficient to destroy the equilibrium, and it is only by enlarging the base of support in one direction more than in the other that a fall can be prevented. The movements by which we regain the perpendicular in the base of support are in a measure automatic. Thus, to resist a force tending to make us fall forward, the foot is rapidly advanced. If the body leans to the left, we suddenly extend the right arm to re-establish the equilibrium. If a force tends to throw us backward, we put a foot behind and throw the body in advance. The man who has a large belly and the man bearing a heavy load upon his shoulders are both obliged to assume attitudes that change the position of the center of gravity. The first carries the body backwards in order that the vertical line passing through this point may also fall between the two feet, and for the same reason, the second bends the body forward. A woman who carries an infant upon her right arm inclines the body to the left side. Thus, we are constantly resorting to mechanics even without possessing the most elementary notions of the science, and the most certain causes of our preservation are found in the continual application of physical laws of which our reason has not the knowledge. When an animal rests upon its four members at the same time, his standing is more firm, more solid, and less fatiguing, for the base of support is then very large. Then, without inconvenience, the feet may be much smaller than in the bipeds and consequently lighter. Of locomotion. The objects of the motions which we perform is either to change the position of certain parts of the body or to transport us from one place to another. The faculty of changing place is called locomotion. The movements of progression by the help of which man and animals change place are produced by certain parts of the body which being flexed rest upon a resisting object and being again immediately extended push forward the rest of the body. In man, the organs of locomotion are the abdominal members, or lower extremities, in quadrupeds, the thoracic, as well as the abdominal members, and in birds that fly, the wings. In walking, the body of man is moved alternately by one of the feet and sustained by the other, without his ever ceasing completely to rest on the ground. This last circumstance distinguishes walking from leaping and running, movements in which the body quits the earth for a moment and launches into the air. In walking, one of the feet is carried forward while the other is extended on the leg, and as this last member is supported on the ground, its elongation displaces the pelvis and throws the whole body forward. 
when the foot which was advanced it lights upon the ground the pelvis turns on the femur of that side and the leg which was at rest behind is flexed and carried front of the other touches the earth and in its turn serves to sustain the body while the other limb by being extended gives a new impulse to the pelvis by the aid of these alternate movements of flexion and extension each limb in turn bears the weight of the body as it would do when standing on one foot and at each step the centre of gravity of the whole mass of the body is pushed forward security in walking is always in a direct ratio to the degree of separation of the feet and in an inverse ratio to the mobility of the surface that supports us it is only at the end of a certain time that sailors walk securely upon the deck when they have once got their sea legs it is very easy to recognize them on the shore from the habit which they have of considerably separating the feet in walking leaping or jumping is a movement by which a man projects himself into the air and again falls to the ground as soon as the effect of the impulsion is lost the mechanism of the leap consists entirely in the previous flexion of the joints and their sudden extension when a jumper wishes to spring he shortens himself by folding himself up as it were upon himself the leg is flexed forward on the foot the thigh is also flexed back on the knee and the trunk with the pelvis are flexed forward on the thigh and when one wishes to spring with all his strength the trunk is flexed upon itself like a spring all these preliminaries of the leap the lower extremities and the body describe a series of zigzags at the moment of the leap all the articulations are extended at the same instant and raise the body with such rapidity that it leaps into the air like an elastic rod that had been bent to the ground and then suddenly abandoned to its elasticity or spring it is easy to perceive that the parts which act most in the leap are the legs indeed it is upon them that the weight to be raised is most considerable the facility and rapidity of the leap are always in direct ratio to the energy of the muscles which determine the extension of the legs it is observed that the most vigorous dancers and even great walkers have the calf strongly developed indeed this part is formed of the muscles which affect the extension of the leg upon the foot running partakes both of walking and leaping there is always a moment in running when the body is suspended in the air a circumstance which distinguishes it from rapid walking in which the foot that rests behind does not leave the ground until the forward one again touches it swimming and flying are movements analogous to those of leaping but which take place in water or in the air fluids whose resistance to a certain extent take the place of that of the ground in the act of leaping when an animal is destined to live in water and to swim its members have a different form from that of those animals which are organized for walking only the limbs are then short and constitute a species of paddles or oars called fins when the animal is designed to elevate himself in the atmosphere the thoracic members on the contrary are very much expanded and are so arranged on each side of the body as to form a kind of movable sail or fan fit to strike the air with force in one of the following lessons when we consider the mammalia and birds we shall recur to the study of these organs and we shall see how the same members may constitute in different animals the instruments of prehension of walking of natation or of flight we here conclude what we propose to say generally on the manner in which the principal phenomena of animal life are performed and on the organs which serve as instruments for the exercise of the faculties with which animals are endowed we shall next proceed to study each of these animals in particular and see in what way they differ from each other end of lesson ten glossary a through c abdomen from the latin abdere to conceal the belly the chief viscera contained in the abdomen are the stomach intestines liver etc absorption from the latin absorbere to suck up the function of absorbent vessels by virtue of which they take up substances from without or within the body acetabulum from the latin acetum vinegar from its resemblance to the ancient greek vinegar vessel called oxybaphon see cotyloid acoustic from the greek akuo i listen relating to sounds acromion from the greek akros extreme and amos the shoulder the superior prominence of the scapula that joins to the clavicle forming the bony point of the shoulder adult one arrived at maturity full grown aliment from the latin alimentum which is formed from alere to nourish 
any substance which if introduced into the system is capable of nourishing it and repairing its losses food alveolus latin the hole in which a tooth is placed alveoli plural of alveolus sockets of the teeth anatomy from the greek ana through and timno i cut the description of the structure of animals the word anatomy properly signifies dissection but it has been appropriated to the study and knowledge of the number shape situation structure and connection in a word of all the apparent properties of organized matter whether animal or vegetable anatomical relating or belonging to anatomy analogous from the greek ana between and logos reason having some resemblance or relation though differing in essential particulars similar analysis from the greek analuo i dissolve the separation of bodies into their component parts anfractuosity from the latin anfractus the bending or winding of a way in or out a groove or furrow based in anatomy to signify sinuous depressions of greater or less depth like those that separate the convolutions of the brain animal from the latin animalis a name given to every animated being provided with digestive organs animalcule from the latin animalacula a diminutive animal animacula plural of animaculum animals that are only perceptible by means of the microscope Analides, a class of animals without vertebrae anus latin the fundament the inferior opening of the bowels aorta from the greek aorte a vessel the great artery which arises from the left ventricle of the heart and conveys the blood to all parts of the body aortic relating to the aorta apineuroses from the greek apo from a neuron a nerve the ancients called every white part neuron membranous expansions of muscles and the tendons are so called apophysis from the greek apo from and phuo i rise an eminence or process of bone apparatus latin ad for and pare to prepare a collection of instruments or organs for any operation whatever an assemblage of organs appendix latin ad to and pendere to hang something added any part that adheres to an organ or is continuous with it arachnides from the greek arachne a spider insects of the genus of spiders arachnoid from the greek arachne a spider's web and eidos resemblance a thin transparent membrane which covers the brain artery from the greek arteria formed according to some from air air and terrine to preserve because it was anciently believed that the arteries were filled with air like the windpipe the vessels which convey blood from the heart to all parts of the body are called arteries arterial belonging or relating to an artery articulate from the latin articulus which is the diminutive of artis a limb which is derived from the greek earthron a joint to join or joint to form words to utter articulation a joint asphyxia from the greek a privative and sphyxis pulse suspended animation asphyxiate in the state of suspended animation astragalus name of the bone of the foot which articulates with the tibia in the ankle joint astronomy from the greek astron a star a nomos law the natural history of the heavenly bodies 
Atmosphere. From the Greek atmos, vapor, and sphira, a sphere or globe. The air which surrounds the earth. Auditorius. Latin. Belonging or relating to the sense of hearing. Oracle. From the Latin auricula, which is the diminutive of aris, an ear. The two oracles of the heart derive the name from their resemblance to ears. Auricular ventricular, relating or belonging both to an oracle and a ventricle. Automatic. From the Greek automatus, self-moved, spontaneous, which is formed from autos, himself, and mao, I desire. Automatic movements are those which depend on the structure of the body and are independent of the will, such as that of respiration, the circulation of the blood, etc. Axillary. From the Latin axilla, the armpit, belonging or relating to the armpit. Azote. From the Greek a, privative, and zoe, life, without life because azote will neither support animal life nor combustion, a gas which is unfit for respiration. It is one of the component parts of the atmosphere. It is also called nitrogen. Bile, a yellow, greenish, viscid, bitter, nauseous fluid secreted by the liver to aid in the process of digestion. The gall. Bolus, Latin. A mass, lump, or mouthful, a ball. Botany, from the Greek botane, a plant, the natural history of plants. Brachial, from the Latin brachium, an arm, belonging or relating to the arm. Brankly, Latin, it is derived from the Greek branchos, the throat. The gills of fishes, they are the respiratory organs of fishes, and are very different from lungs, both in their form and structure. Bronchle, from the Greek bronchos, the throat, the two branches of the windpipe, which convey air to the lungs. Calcus, Latin, genitive of calx, the heel. Chimera, Latin, a chamber. Canine, from the Latin canis, a dog, the name of certain teeth. Capillary, from the Latin capillus, hair. Hair-like, small. The capillary vessels are the extremely minute terminations of the arteries and commencing branches of the veins. Capsules, dental. Membranous pouches in which the teeth are formed. Cardia, from the Greek cardia, the heart. The left opening of the stomach where the esophagus enters it carotid the great arteries of the neck which convey blood to the head are so called carpus from the greek kapos the wrist the part between the forearm and hand cartilage gristle a solid part of the animal body of medium consistence between bone and ligament caudal from the latin cauda a tail belonging or relating to the tail Cava, Latin, hollow. Vena cava, the hollow or deep-seated vein. A name given to the two great veins of the body, which meet at the right oracle of the heart. Cerebellum, the diminutive of cerebrum, the little brain. The inferior portion of the brain contained in the cranium. Cerebral spinal, belonging or relating to both the cerebrum and spine. Cerebrum the brain the term is sometimes applied to the whole contents of the cranium at others to the upper portion the posterior and inferior being called cerebellum cervical from the latin cervix the neck belonging or relating to the neck choroid from the greek chorion the skin and idus resemblance the name of several vascular membranes a thin membrane of a very dark color which lines the sclerotica internally. Choroides, choroid. Chyle, from the Greek kulos, nutritious juice.
a nutritive fluid of a whitish appearance which is extracted from food by the action of the digestive organs chyle latin of chyle chylification from the latin chylus chylic and facere to make the formation of chyle by the digestive processes chyme from the greek kumos juice a kind of grayish pulp formed from the food after it has been for some time in the stomach chymification from the greek kumos juice and the latin facere to make the formation of chyme cilia latin the eyelashes clavicle from the latin clavus a key the collarbone coccygean relating to the coccyx which is an assemblage of small bones appended to the sacrum if prolonged it would constitute a tail cochlea latin a snail shell the name of one of the three cavities which form the labyrinth of the ear celiac the name of one of the arteries of the abdomen concha the hollow part of the cartilage of the external ear condyle from the greek condulus a knot an eminence a bump a small round eminence of bone entering into the composition of an articulation conjunctiva latin formed from con with and jungere to join the mucous membrane which covers the anterior surface of the ball of the eye and unites it to the lids corium the skin cornea one of the coats of the eye so called because it has some resemblance to horn it forms about one-fifth of the anterior part of the eye cotyloid from the greek katule a drinking cup and idus resemblance the name of a hemispherical cavity in a bone of the pelvis which receives the head of the thigh bone forming the hip joint it is also called the acetabulum cranium from the greek cranon head the skull crustacea from the latin crusta a crust a class of animals whose bodies are enclosed in a covering like the crab cubital relating to the cubitus cubitus latin one of the bones of the forearm which is also called ulna end of glossary a through c glossary d through m deciduous from the latin cadere to fall falling that which falls off not permanent deglutition from the latin deglutire to swallow the act by which substances are passed from the mouth into the stomach through the pharynx and esophagus derma greek the skin diaphanous from the greek dia through and thanane to shine permitting the passage of light diaphragm from the greek diaphragma a partition the fleshy or muscular partition between the cavity of the chest and cavity of the abdomen diastole from the greek diastelo i open i dilate the dilation of the heart and arteries when the blood enters their cavities dorsal from the latin dorsum the back belonging or relating to the back dura latin hard dura mater is a dense membrane which covers the brain lying between it and the skull encephalon from the greek egg in and cephale head the brain and spinal marrow epidermis from the greek epi upon and derma skin the external covering of the derma the cuticle or scarf skin epiglottis from the greek epi upon and glottis the glottis a species of cartilaginous valve situate at the upper part of the larynx behind the base of the tongue it closes at the moment of swallowing and thus assists in preventing the passage of alimentary substances into the air tubes ethmoid from the greek ethmos a sieve and idus resemblance 
the ethmoid bone so called because its upper plate is pierced by a considerable number of holes is situate at the base of the cranium betwixt the orbits excretion from the latin excernere to separate the separation or throwing off of those matters from the body of an animal which are supposed to be useless as perspiration etc the matters thrown off from the body as useless are termed excretions excretory an excretory vessel or duct is one which transmits the fluid secreted by a gland either externally or into the reservoirs in which it has to be deposited excretory organ means any organ charged with the office of excreting thus the skin is said to be an excretory organ because through it the perspiration or sweat is excreted exhalation from the latin exhalare to throw out to exhale that which exhales from our any body a function by the virtue of which certain fluids obtained from the blood are spread in the form of dew on the surface of membranes either for the sake of being thrown out of the body or to serve for certain purposes the sweat is also an example of exhalation as well as of an excretion extend to straighten to stretch out when a limb is straightened it is said to be extended extensor a muscle whose office it is to extend certain parts external outside it is used in relation to the middle line of the body for example the little toe is external and the big toe internal the corner of the eye next to the nose is the internal corner and the other the external corner of the eye externus latin external extremities the limbs the legs and arms fascia latin formed from fasces a bundle the aponeurotic expansions of muscles which bind parts together are so termed fasci plural of fascia fosses latin the swallow or gorge foctum latin the genitive case plural of fo see isthmus focum latin femoral relating to the femur femur latin the thigh bone fenestra latin a window an opening or hole fiber an organic filament of a solid consistence and more or less extensible which enters into the composition of every animal and vegetable texture fibril fibrilla a very small fiber fibrous composed of fibers belonging or relating to fiber fibula latin a clasp a brace the name of the long small bone situate at the outer part of the leg it assists materially in holding the foot in its proper position filament from the latin filamentum which is the diminutive of filum a thread a very small fiber a fibril fissure from the latin fissura which is formed from fendere to cleave a long narrow cleft or opening flex to bend flexion the state of being bent flexor a muscle whose opposite is to bend certain parts follicle from the latin follis a bag a diminutive glandular sac or bag foramen latin a hole foramina latin plural of foramen holes fossa latin from fadio i dig a cavity of greater or less depth the entrance to which is always larger than the base the nasal fossae are two large irregular cavities situate between the orbits below the cranium and behind the nose the nostrils function from the latin fungor i act i perform the action of an organ or set of organs we see for example by the function of the eye and the function or action of the ear enables us to hear ganglion from the greek ganglion a knot nervous ganglions are enlargements or knots in the course of a nerve ganglionic consisting of ganglions 
relating to ganglions. Gas. Any substance or fluid which is permanently aeriform under the ordinary conditions of the atmosphere. Gastric. From the Greek gaste, the stomach. Belonging or relating to the stomach. Genus. Latin. A kindred, breed, race, stock, lineage, or family. Genera. Plural of genus. Generic. Belonging or relating to genus. Geology. From the Greek geo, the earth, and logos, a discourse. A description of the structure of the earth. Glenoid. From the Greek glene, the pupil, and idus, resemblance. Any shallow articular cavity which receives the head of a bone. Globule. From the Latin globulus, a small globe. Glottis, a small oblong aperture situate at the upper part of the larynx. Hemisphere, from the Greek emesis, half, and sphira, sphere or globe. One half of a sphere or globe, or globular body. The brain is divided into two hemispheres. Humerus, the bone of the arm which is situate between the shoulder joint and the elbow. Iliac. From the Latin ilia, the flank, relating or belonging to the flank or ilium. Ilium, the haunch bone. Incisor, from the Latin incido, I cut. The teeth which occupy the anterior part of the upper and lower jaws are called incisors or incisor teeth because they are used for cutting the food in the manner of cutting in tremulous. Instruments. Insect. From the Latin insectum, which is formed from secari to cut, the generic name of small animals whose body is, as it were, divided or cut into several parts, as the chest and belly. Insects have neither a circulating apparatus nor vertebrae, but they possess an apparatus for breathing, have jointed extremities, and generally have wings. Intercostal. From the Latin inter, between, and costa a rib, that which is situate between the ribs. Internal, see external. Intussusception, from the Latin intus, within, and suscipio, I receive. The mode of increase peculiar to organized bodies. Ischiatic, from the Greek ischion, the haunch, an epithet applied to parts connected with the haunch. Ischium, the hip bone, the seat bone. Isthmus, Latin, formed from the Greek isthmus, a narrow tongue of land joining a peninsula to a continent. Anatomists have given the name isthmus phocium, isthmus of the phocis, to the strait or passage between the mouth and the pharynx. Juxtaposition, from the Latin juxta, near to, and ponere, to place. The mode of increase proper to minerals, which is by the successive addition of new matter on the outside of that which already existed. It is the office of intussusception. Labyrinth, from the Latin labyrinthus, which is formed from the Greek labyrinthos, a place full of turnings, the exit of which is not easily discoverable. Anatomists have given this name to the aggregate of parts constituting the internal ear. Lacrimal, from the Latin lacrima, a tear, relating to the tears. Lacrimalia, Latin, belonging or relating to the tears. Lamina, Latin, a plate or thin piece of metal or bone. Lamini, Latin, plural of lamina. Larynx, from the Greek larynx, a whistle, the apparatus of voice. It is situate at the superior and anterior part of the neck and at the top of the trachea, with which it communicates. Levator, a muscle whose office it is to raise or elevate certain parts. Ligament, from the Latin ligare, to tie, a name given to fibrous structures which serve to unite bones and form articulations. Lobe, a round projecting part of an organ. Lumbar, relating to the loins. Lymph, a name given to the fluid contained in the lymphatic vessels 
and thoracic duct of animals. Lymphatic, partaking of the nature of lymph, relating or belonging to lymph. Malar, bone, from the Latin malum, an apple, so called from its roundness, the cheekbone. Malleus, Latin, a hammer. Mammalia, from mama, a breast, animals that suckle their young. Mammology, from the Latin mamma, breast, and the Greek logos, a discourse or treatise, that part of natural history which treats of mammiferous animals. Mammary, from the Latin mamma, a breast, belonging or relating to the breast. Mammifere, Mammifer, from the Latin mamma, a breast, and ferro, I carry, animals that have teeth. Mammiferous, belonging or relating to mammiferi. Mater, Latin, mother. Meatus, Latin, a passage. Medulla, Latin, marrow. Membrana, Latin, a membrane. Membrane, a name given to different thin organs representing species of supple, more or less elastic webs. Membranous or membraneous, belonging to membrane. Mesentery, from the Greek mesos, in the middle, and enteron, and intestine, a term applied to several duplicatures of the peritoneum, which maintain the different portions of the intestinal canal in their respective situations allowing, however, more or less mobility. Mesenteric, relating to the mesentery. Metacarpus, from the Greek meta, after, and carpus, the wrist, that part of the hand which is between the wrist and fingers. Metatarsus, from the Greek meta, after, and tarsus, the instep, that part of the foot which is between the instep and toes. Meteorology, from the Greek meteorios, a meteor, and logos, a discourse, the natural history of the atmosphere. Mineralogy, from the Latin minera, a mineral or mine, and the Greek logos, a discourse, the natural history of minerals. Mitro, of the form of a mitre or bishop's bonnet, the name of two valves of the heart. Molar, from the Greek mulos, a millstone or grindstone, or from the Latin molo, I grind that which bruises or grinds, the name of certain teeth. Molar teeth, the grinders, jaw teeth. Mollusca, from the Latin mollus, soft, a class of marine animals without vertebrae, which have blood vessels, a spinal marrow, and simple body without articulated limbs. Molluscus, relating to mollusca. Motor, motive that which moves or gives the power to move. Myopia, from the Greek mus, a mouse, and ops, sight, because mice were supposed to be short-sighted, nearsightedness. End of glossary, D through M. Glossary, N through Z. Nares, Latin, the nostrils. Nasal, relating to the nose. Nitrogen, from the Greek nitron, nitric, and genao, I beget, the name given to the azote on account of its being an acidifiable base of nitric acid. Nutrition, the function by which the various organs receive the nutritive substances necessary to repair their losses and maintain their strength. Oblongata, Latin, elongated, lengthened. Obscura, Latin, dark, obscure. Esophagus, from the Greek oil, I carry, unfago, I eat. The gullet, a tube leading from the mouth to the stomach for the transmission of food. Olfactory, from the Latin olfactus, the smell, that which belongs to or relates to the sense of smell. Orbiculare, Latin orbicular. Orbit, from the Latin orbis, a circle. The circular cavities are so called which lodge the organs of sight. Organ, from the Greek organon, an instrument, 
part of an organized being destined to exercise some particular function for example the ears are the organs of hearing the muscles are the organs of motion etc organic relating to an organ organize composed of organs having a mode of structure os latin bone ossification from the latin os a bone and facere to make the formation of bone ovalis ovale latin oval oxygen from the greek oxus acid and genomai i engender the generator of acid as it was believed to be exclusively when this name was given to it a gas which constitutes about one-fifth of our atmosphere which is necessary to the respiration of animals and consequently indispensable to animal life but it cannot be breathed alone for any considerable time with impunity requiring to be mixed with about four parts of nitrogen or azote as is the case in our atmosphere to render it suitable for respiration palati latin the genitive case of palatum the palate palpebro from the latin palpebra the eyelid belonging or relating to the eyelid pancreas from the greek pan all and creas flesh that is quite fleshy a gland deeply seated in the abdomen which resembles the salivary glands in its structure and has been called the abdominal salivary gland it is this part of the calf which is called in common language the sweetbread pancreatic relating to the pancreas papillae plural of papilla parietes from the latin paries a wall a name given to parts which form the enclosure the limits of different cavities of the body papilla latin a nipple a name given to small eminences which appear to be formed by the ultimate expansion of the vessels and nerves parotid from the greek para about and us the ear the parotid gland is the largest of the salivary glands seated under the ear and near the angle of the jaw patella latin the diminutive of patina a dish so called from its shape the knee pan pelvis latin a basin the name of the bony structure at the lower part of the trunk which forms the inferior boundary of the abdomen gives support or place of foundation to the spinal column and affords points of articulation for the thigh bones constituting the hip joint pericardium from the greek peri around and cardia the heart the pericardium is a membranous sac which envelops the heart and the arterial and venous trunks that pass from or into it peritoneum from the greek peri around and tino i stretch a serous membrane which lines the abdominal cavity and covers entirely or in part all the organs contained in it and by folds maintains them in their respective relations the peritoneum is a sort of sac without aperture which covers the abdominal organs without containing them within it the internal surface of this sac is smooth and lubricated by a serous watery fluid petrus from the greek petra a rock a stone a part of the temporal bone which contains the internal organs of hearing is so called from resembling a stone in hardness phalanges the plural of phalanx phalanx from the greek phalanx a file of soldiers the bones composing the fingers and toes they are named first second and third phalanges pharynx from the greek pharynx the pharynx the swallow the superior opening of the esophagus phenomenon from the greek phenomai i appear appearance visible quality phenomena plural of phenomenon philosophy from the greek phileo i love and sophia wisdom or knowledge a clear and distinct knowledge of things the pursuit of truth physiology from the greek phusis nature and logos a discourse the science which treats of the functions of animals or vegetables porta 
latin a gate the part of the liver where its vessels enter as by a gate the vena porta is a vascular apparatus which conveys black blood to the liver prehension from the latin prehendere to lay hold of the prehension of aliment consists in laying hold of and conveying food into the mouth presbyopia from the greek presbus an old man an ops an eye long-sightedness primer from the latin primus first an elementary book a first book process from the latin procedo i go before an eminence of bone an apophysis pubis the anterior and middle part of the pelvis pulmonary belonging or relating to the lungs puncta latin plural from punctum points pylorus from the greek pule a gate and urus a guardian the lower or right orifice of the stomach radial belonging or relating to the radius radius latin a spoke so called from its shape one of the bones of the forearm ramusculae from the latin ramus a branch a diminutive branch receptaculum latin a receptacle a reservoir renal belonging or relating to the kidney retina from the latin rete a net the essential organ of vision on it the images of objects are impressed rotator from the latin rota a wheel a name given to muscles which turn the parts to which they are attached on their axes rotula the patella rotundum rotunda latin round sacral relating to the sacrum sacrum the bone which forms the posterior part of the pelvis and is a continuation of the vertebral column saliva spittle salivary belonging or relating to saliva sap the nutritious liquid or blood of plants scapula the shoulder blade science from the latin scientia knowledge any art or species of knowledge arranged in order or on some plan sclerotica from the greek skleoro i harden a hard resisting pearly white opaque membrane which forms the posterior four-fifths of the external coat or covering of the eyeball secretion from the latin secernere to separate the organic functions of the several glands by which they separate from the blood the materials which they respectively demand for their several purposes each organ according to its peculiar structure differs from the rest and hence we have the formation of the different fluids as bile saliva milk etc the fluids thus elaborated or separated from the blood are also termed secretions sense the faculty of receiving impressions from external objects sensibility the ability or faculty of receiving impressions from surrounding objects and being conscious of them sinuous relating or belonging to a sinus partaking of the nature of a sinus sinus any cavity the interior of which is more expanded than the entrance in this respect being the reverse of fossa which see skeleton from the greek skelo i dry the aggregate of the hard parts of the body or the bones skin the dense elastic membrane which envelops the body it consists of three layers or laminae the derma the epidermis and rete mucosa the last being situate between the other two the color of the different races of men depends upon the color of the rete mucosnet the other two layers being alike or nearly so in the whole human family sphenoid from the greek sphen a wedge and eidos resemblance a bone situate on the middle line and at the base of the cranium it articulates with all the other bones of the cranium supports them and strengthens their union acting very much like the keystone of an arch stapes latin a stirrup the innermost of the small bones of the ear so called because it resembles a stirrup sternum 
from the greek steros solid the breastbone subclavian from the latin sub under and clavis the clavicle that which is under the clavicle subcutaneous from the latin sub under and cutis the skin that which is under the skin sublingual from the latin sub under and lingua the tongue that which is under the tongue submaxillary from the latin sub under and maxilla the jaw that which is under the jaws suture from the latin suo i stitch a kind of immovable articulation or joint in which the bones unite by means of serrated edges which are as it were dovetailed into each other the articulations of the bones of the cranium are of this kind symmetrical from the greek sum and metron measure a term applied to those parts of the body which if seated on the middle line may be divided into two equal and perfectly like halves or which if situate the one to the right and the other to the left of this line have similar conformation and a perfectly analogous arrangement syncope from the greek subkapto i fall down fainting complete loss of sensation and motion with considerable diminution or entire suspension of the pulsations of the heart and of the movements of respiration hence syncope resembles death synovia from the greek sun with an oan an egg the lubricating fluids of the joints which enable the surfaces of the bones and tendons to glide smoothly over each other system from the greek sun together and istemi i place an arrangement according to some plan or method systole from the greek sustelo i contract the contraction of the heart by which it gives impulse to the blood or causes its progression in the blood vessel it is opposed to diastole of this organ tarsus from the greek tarsus any row the sole of the foot the posterior part of the foot which in man consists of seven bones and forms the heel and instep a thin plate of cartilage seated in the substance of the free edge of each eyelid tears the fluid secreted by the lacrimal gland and poured between the globe of the eye and the eyelids to facilitate the motions of those parts tendon from the greek tino i stretch strong white fibrous cords which connect the muscles to the bones which they move the tendons may be considered as so many cords for transmitting the motion of the muscles to the bones or levers tendinous belonging to or partaking of the nature of tendon thorax from the greek thorax the chest it is bounded posteriorly by the vertebra laterally by the ribs and scapula anteriorly by the sternum above by the clavicle and below by the diaphragm it is destined to lodge to protect the chief organs of respiration and circulation the lungs and heart thoracic belonging to the thorax tibia latin a flute the largest bone of the leg is so called tissue from the latin texere to weave the interlacement or union of many things which form a body as threads of flax silk wool etc of which cloths and stuffs are made from analogy the term is employed in anatomy to describe the substances of which the organs of animals in general and of man in particular are formed and which result from the interlacement of fibres it is applied to the different kinds of organization of the body as for example the muscular tissue the osseous tissue meaning the structure of which the muscles and bones are composed trachea from the greek trachus rough and arteria an artery which is formed from the ar air and terrine to keep the canal which conveys the air to the lungs the windpipe tricuspid from the latin tres three and cuspus a point having three points the three valves situate in the right auriculo-ventricular opening of the heart are thus named tunica latin a tunic or coat or covering of an organ tympanum 
Latin, a drum, the drum of the ear. Tympani, genitive case of tympanum, of the drum of the ear. Ulna, the bone of the forearm which forms the prominence of the elbow during the flexion of that joint. Ulnar, relating to the ulna. Unguiform, from the Latin unguis, a human nail, and form a shape of the form of a nail. Valve, from the Latin valve, doors, a small door. Any membrane or doubling of membrane which prevents fluid from flowing back in the vessels and canals of the animal body. Vein, the veins are vessels for the conveyance of black blood from all parts of the body to the heart. They are found wherever there are arteries. Vellum, Latin, a veil. Venus, relating to the veins. Ventricle, from the Latin venter, a belly, a name given in anatomy to various parts. Vermiform, from the Latin vermis, a worm, and forma, form, worm-shaped. Vermicular, belonging or relating to worms. The motion of the intestines is vermicular, that is, resembling that of a worm. Vertebra, from the Latin vetere, to turn. This name has been given to each of the bones which by their union form the vertebral or spinal column, vulgarly called the backbone. Vertebri, the plural of vertebra. Vertebral, belonging to the vertebri. Viscid, viscous, glutinous, sticky, tenacious. Viscous, any bowel or entrail or internal part, as the heart, liver, lungs, pancreas, etc., Viscera, the plural of viscous. Vitreous, resembling glass, glassy. Zoology, from the Greek zoon, an animal, and logos, a discourse, that part of natural history which treats of animals. Zoologist, one devoted to the study of zoology. End of glossary, N through Z. End of the Elements of Anatomy and Physiology by William Rushenberger.